distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the International Symposium on Climate Security in Asia Pacific. Thank you for joining us from all over the world. This symposium has simultaneous interpretation. Please select Japanese from the interpretation button in your Zoom window if you prefer Japanese. This symposium is a simultaneous interpretation. Please select Japanese my name is Yuri Katsuike, Senior Communication Officer of IGES. It is my great pleasure to moderate the opening session of this significant event. This symposium is proudly co-organized by IGES, the Institute for Global Environmental Strategy and the Institute for Future Initiatives the University of Tokyo, and our broadcast originates from the University of Tokyo. The symposium will run for six hours with several intermissions between each session. For a detailed schedule, please refer to today's program by clicking on the link provided in your Zoom chat box, which has been shared with you just now. Today, we have a lineup of distinguished speakers. Due to time constraints, we regret to inform you that we won't be able to collect the questions from the audience. We appreciate your understanding and cooperation with this arrangement. Upon closing the Zoom window, whether during the symposium or after its conclusion, you will be prompt to complete a survey about your experience today. We would appreciate your feedback. Additionally, please note that the presentation materials and the recording of the symposium will be made available on the symposium website in about a week from today. Now, let's proceed to the first agenda item. I would like to extend an invitation to the co-organizers of the symposium to share their opening remarks. Mr. Tsuyoshi Kawakami, Acting Managing Director of IGES, the floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon from Tokyo. I'm Toshi Kawakami, Deputy Managing Director at IGES, the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies. I'd like to welcome all of you to the International Symposium on Climate Security in Asia Pacific. Together with our partner, the Institute for Future Initiatives at the University of Tokyo, IGES has organized this international symposium to mark the launch of Asia Pacific Climate Security Project, or APCS. APCS aims to bring about better understanding of the interventions needed in the dynamic policy aid. This symposium gathers together researchers and practitioners from all over the world to encourage productive discussion on climate survey in a security in Japan and the Asia Pacific region. As the climate crisis worsens, the nexus between climate change and the security considerations is attracting the attention of both policymakers and the economic community. Despite its socio-political importance, the significance of considering climate change from a security and diplomatic perspective has not yet been fully explored in the policy arena and on the ground actions. The interwoven nature of this nexus requires policymakers to be equipped with informed decision making approaches to shape efficient policies. Against this background, we are hoping that participants at today's event will discuss the challenges faced by the various interconnected topics, working to design research elections and how to respond to these challenges 
and unravel the complex dynamics among them. Ladies and gentlemen, I hear that more than 500 participants have registered online for this event, not only from Asia Pacific, but also from many other regions. I think this shows the high level of global interest in climate security. We are delighted that so many participants could join us. I very much hope that today will be productive and successful for everyone, and that our efforts will contribute to regional and indeed global resilience and stability. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Mr. Kawakami, for your inspiring message. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our esteemed co-organizer, Professor Ichiro Sakata, Vice Director, Institute for Future Initiatives, and Special Advisor to the President of the Uni University of Tokyo. Professor Sakata, please take the floor. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, uh, welcome you all to uh, this uh, Ito International Center. My name is Ichiro Sakata, uh, Vice Director of IFI. Uh, the IFI is an organization that aims to promote cross-disciplinary research and has also made uh, proposals for a future better society by utilizing uh, the networks inside and outside of the university. In addition to policy recommendations, many of our faculty members are also involved in real activities to improve uh, society with uh, stakeholders. In this sense, I find play a unique role within the uh, University of Tokyo. The Ito International Center is designed as a, a gateway facility. Uh, connecting the youth of here with a wide range of stakeholders. The IFI play a role in supporting the uh, function of, the, of this gateway. Currently, uh, we are uh, planning, the, planning to establish an acceleration function following that of the Stanford University in order to strengthen our active efforts to address social issues. The word uh, nexus appears in the concept paper for today's meeting. At IFI, we are aware of the nexus in academic research and society, and we hope to build the bridge needed to resolve our uh, issues. I also serve as a special advisor to our president, and I'm in charge of the uh, SDGs symposium uh, with Springer Nature uh, this month. At each, uh, at, at each of this symposium, we have various uh, nexuses, nexus issues on the agenda. Uh, to the, uh, this year, uh, actually, the uh, planet health. We believe that the nexus between uh, climate and sec uh, security, which is the main uh, subject of today's discussion, is one of the most uh, anticipated field in society today. Today, we hope that the uh, reactions among, uh, among the various knowledge will uh, derive new horizon of the knowledge. I wish uh, you all the uh, best uh, for today's meeting. Thank you. Thank you for your important words and leadership that have made this symposium possible, Professor Sakar. We will now move on to the plenary session entitled Climate Security Risk in Asia Pacific. The session will start with a keynote speech by Professor Hideshi Tokuchi, President of the Research Institute for Peace and Security, followed by a panel discussion. 
Professor Tokuchi, the floor is yours. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, my name is Hiresh Tokuchi. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this very uh, important event. Uh, first of all, let me thank the uh, Institute for Global Environmental uh, Strategies and uh, Institute for uh, Future Initiatives uh, for this precious opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm very much honored and I'm grateful to all those uh, people who made my uh, presence here today uh, possible. Thank you. Um, there are uh, so many uh, security risks, both traditional and uh, non-traditional in today's world. Uh, they are uh, closely uh, related with each other. And in the interest of time, uh, I would like to discuss four points uh, in terms of climate security risks in the uh, Asia uh, Pacific region. And uh, however, uh, I have just one small comment on the title of today's symposium. It doesn't use the term Indo-Pacific. Uh, actually, uh, it's very interesting to me. I actually, I like the word Asia-Pacific, particularly in the discussion of climate change. As often said, uh, that uh, this region is a he huge seascape. Uh, in this sense, the term Indo-Pacific uh, uh, better expresses the characteristics of this region because the term Indo-Pacific uh, hyphenates the two great oceans, namely the world's largest ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and the world's third largest ocean, uh, the uh, Indian Ocean. Uh, but this region has a huge uh, uh, land mass of the Asian continent. And mankind can't live without uh, sea space, but uh, we can't live in it. Uh, we need land to live on. Um, in, and in addition, from a traditional regional security perspective, it is not appropriate to call the, uh, for example, uh, to call the US alliance uh, network of this region as an alliance network of the Indo-Pacific. Actually, it is misleading. Uh, all the U.S. alliances in this region, you know, Japan, U.S., uh, Japan, uh, I'm sorry, U.S., Korea, uh, U.S., Australia, U.S., Thailand, and U.S., uh, Philippines, all these alliance relationships with the United States um, are in the Pacific side uh, of the region. So as a student of regional alliance relations, I preferred uh, the older term, Asia-Pacific. Uh, but even from a traditional pers uh, security perspective, engagement of India is increasingly important. And from a uh, climate security perspective too, uh, probably both terms, Indo-Pacific and Asia-Pacific, will survive uh, for the time being. I will use both terms uh, interchangeably uh, in my talk if necessary. Um, my first point, is that geopolitical uh, consideration occupies the mind of policymakers and practitioners involved in national security uh, in some parts of the world, including in North uh, East Asia. Uh, today, uh, political leaders describe drastic change of the world uh, in various terms. Uh, you know, German Chancellor uh, Olaf Scholz said in February 2022, we are living through a watershed era in this famous uh, Titan and the speech. Uh, US President uh, Biden often said, we are at a significant inflection point in world history. Uh, Japan's prime minister, uh, uh, Kishida said several times, the international community is at a historic turning point. Japan's national security strategy released in December 2022 begins with the sentence that the international community is facing challenges defining an era. 
these remarks uh, primarily mean geopolitical shift uh, of the world. The same strategy document also states uh, <clears throat> Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, the same uh, uh, strategy document also states that non-traditional challenges, including climate change and infectious disease uh, crisis, are emerging, requiring cross-border cooperation amongst nations. And today, we are in an era whose confrontation and cooperation are increasingly intertwined in international relations. But uh, it is uh, quite clear that the focus of this strategy document is on traditional security. Uh, this region, particularly Northeast Asia, is more of an international society of sovereign states rather than of a global society without national borders. This region is at the forefront of the intense rivalry of great powers today. If the international community is truly united, non-traditional challenges can be well contained as we see the drastic uh, decrease of piracy incidents uh, in the Gulf of Aden in the past 15 years, but it is easier said than done. Uh, for example, uh, soon after the US House Speaker Nancy Pelosi uh, visited Taiwan in August 2022, uh, China announced sanctions against the United States, including the suspension of climate talks. Uh, also, many of uh, minerals uh, used in key renewable energy technology uh, can be easily weaponized in international relations. Priority of non-traditional issues, including climate security, does not seem to be high in this region. Uh, if I'm wrong, uh, I'm very happy. Um, uh, cooperation in climate security is increasingly difficult uh, behind this great power rivalry. This is a big risk. Uh, second point, lack of region-wide shared understanding of this issue. There are diverse challenges in this region in climate security terms. Extreme weather events, uh, shortage of food, uh, spread of infectious diseases, sea level rise, etc., etc. In case of Japan, Japan is proactive on human security related agenda. And uh, in this context, puts a great deal of effort in HADR. Uh, but Japan is more interested in disaster relief related to earthquake uh, because disasters could happen even without any reference to climate change. As uh, uh, Dr. Kameyama, and also, uh, Dr. Keishi Ono pointed out uh, uh, several years ago, uh, Japan is better able to understand the importance of resilience building regardless of any uh, connection to climate change. Attention to climate security is prone to become blurred. Uh, they also pointed out that uh, Japan has not experienced environmental immigration perhaps due to the uh, relative, the, uh, excuse me, uh, longer distance from the small Pacific Island states. And thus, it is uh, difficult for the Japanese people to imagine a large number of displaced refugees uh, flowing into Japan as a result of uh, climate change. On the other hand, on the other hand, uh, Japanese uh, security experts are uh, well, generally speaking, alert to Arctic uh, security uh, due to uh, climate change. While uh, warmer and more navigable Arctic will provide uh, shorter shipping routes between Europe and Asia, uh, the Arctic will become a new venue for the flow of naval forces and accordingly, a new venue for great power rivalry. Uh, particularly after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. China is also interested in the Arctic to promote uh, its uh, polar silk road project. And India uh, is uh, also uh, interested in the Ar Arctic. And actually, according to uh, <clears throat> the Arctic policy of India, 
uh, India is impacted due to the likely effect of the vulnerability of the Arctic caused by unprecedented change in the climate on critical aspects of national development, including economic and water security. Um, each aspect of climate security challenges must be dealt with in response to its individual characteristics. But this region is a huge space, as it is said to be uh, from uh, polar bears to penguins or you know, from Hollywood to Bollywood, a uh, lack of a region-wide holistic understanding of the entire security issues related to climate change would undermine promotion of climate security. And uh, third one, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh. Can you go back to the slide, please? Sorry. I made a mistake. Very sorry about that. All right, thank you. Oh, 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 oh I'm sorry. Oh, it doesn't work. Doesn't work. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Well, third, uh, necessity of a whole of government approach must be widely shared. Uh, as already discussed, issues are diverse, and accordingly, means and actors are also diverse. Therefore, it is critically important to master the efforts of all relevant organizations. Uh, but the term security sometimes works against such efforts. Security couldn't be achieved by military efforts alone and the military establishment is fully aware of it. But in general, just in general though, uh, other organizations are still accustomed to narrower definition of security. Uh, honestly, I'm not so sure if uh, it is truly helpful to use the term climate security or not, but the motive uh, for the use of it is fully understood. Uh, I guess, that uh, the most needed uh, mindset is a whole of government uh, uh, perspective. Climate security is not just about reduction of greenhouse uh, gas emission. It is also about response and adaptation to the ramification of climate change. It is related to fishery, agriculture, uh, water resource, transportation, health, medicine, uh, infrastructure, law enforcement, military, and beyond. And finally, uh, I'd like to touch upon the credibility of scientific knowledge. It is the basis of the entire efforts for climate security. Climate change and other environmental issues are often viewed as a favorite agenda item for so-called liberals, and they are not favored by the conservatives. But action against climate change is not leftist movement or any other political uh, movement in disguise. Politicization of the issue is somewhat inevitable because uh, anyway, it is part of politics, uh, but uh, it will not necessarily help generate a great momentum based on broad public consensus to promote climate security measures. If we do not have to seriously worry about such a wrong view uh, of climate security discussion, it will be good. But as the uh, climate science uh, has uncertainties uh, in its findings and uh, predictions, it is always prone to extreme criticism to exploit the uncertainties in their favor. I strongly believe that promotion of science, uh, as well as promotion of scientific mind in uh, ordinary public is critically important. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Tokushi. Moving forward to the panel discussion, I am happy to introduce Dr. Naoyuki Okano, Policy Researcher, Adaptation and Water Area of IGES, 
we, who will moderate the panel. Dr. Okano, please take the floor. Thank you. Uh, my name is Naoyuki Okano from IGES. I'll be happy to moderate the first panel. So without further uh, delay, I'd like to invite my panelists. So first of all, Mr. Tomokazu Serizawa from UNDP, please come to the floor. Just call them. So it's Michael as well. Uh, you can like uh, sit from here without no words. Thank you. Uh, Professor Michael Merring from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Come to the floor. Sorry, our table is a bit tiny. <laughs> Please squeeze. Uh, uh, so Hideshi Tokuchi Sensei again. Please join the panel. And uh, Professor Yasuko Kameyama from the University of Tokyo. Please join us. And lastly, we have a very big panel. So Mr. Lucas Bittenger uh, from uh, Adelphi, Germany. Please join us. So I'd like to make this panel more like, a, not like a proper presentation and a discussion, but rather more conversational. So for that, I prepared uh, two guiding questions that I'd like you to engage with, and I hope that you check it before <laughs> you come here. So uh, I ask these questions, and I expect you, each of you to answer within four or five minutes for each question, and each, actually each guiding question has support couple of sub questions. So please uh, take uh, whichever one that you uh, feel comfortable and you like to intervene. So I'd like to hear your insights to the question. So I start with uh, Lucas with the first guiding question. The first question is, what are the climate security risks you think are essential in the current era? And are there any particular risks and challenges that you can think of for the Asia Pacific region? And if you can think of any policies or interventions that needed to mitigate such quantities, please explore that intervention. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation. Um, uh, sorry, please uh, briefly introduce before you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. So my name is Lucas Huttinger. I'm a senior advisor at Adelphi. We're a billion-based think tank and consultancy. We've been working on the links between climate change, environmental change, and conflict um, for the past 20 years. And I've been with Adelphi for the past 14 years, also specifically working on those issues um, in the Asia Pacific region, but also beyond. And you know, kind of my remarks will be based on kind of our broad experience with kind of better understanding the links between climate change, um, conflict, and insecurity. Um, and I think the first point I want to make is really that within that time frame, like the last 10, 20 years, our understanding of the links between climate change and conflict has really um, been has much improved. Um, so we um, have much more and much better evidence um, to um, to understand what the specific links are. Um, and um, what most of the research agrees on is um, that there is no simple causal link between climate change and insecurity. So not everywhere and all the time does climate change lead to more insecurity and conflict. Um, but the research also um, shows um, more and more that um, there are certain risk factors that make it more likely that climate change leads to more insecurity and conflict. And that's also the case in the Asia Pacific region. And we're getting much better now at identifying those context factors that make um, insecurity more likely as a consequence of climate change. Um, and some of these include existing conflicts, um, in existing political instability, governance issues, and in particular also marginalization and exclusion. Um, and then if when we look at the Asia Pacific region, um, there's really a range of different climate related security risks and the, they vary a lot depending on the specific impacts of climate change, as well as the context in which they play out and I just want to highlight some of these some examples um, to make that a bit more um, more concrete. So um, we already heard that today, disasters are definitely a major um, climate security risk, so weather-induced disasters in particular. Um, 
to the direct impacts um, in terms of the loss of life and um, the destruction of infrastructure, of course, a major concern, but also the kind of longer term impacts of disasters um, on the stability of states. So, for example, the long term economic impacts of um, repeat disasters um, that can really impact the ability of governments to provide services and to provide development and also the role that um, disasters can play in undermining the legitimacy um, of governments in contributing to political discontent, which we could see, for example, um, in Thailand in 2011, when we had very strong monsoon, very strong flooding, and how that contributed to political discontent and protests that escalated um, um, very quickly. Um, another example are increasing um, competition around natural resources. Um, so um, we can see that um, tensions, competition and conflicts around land, water, forests, fisheries, uh, as well as extractive resources such as minerals and metals are um, increasing. Um, they particularly play out on a local level. So for example, we can see the links between resource extraction um, and security risks in Myanmar. We can also see the role that land conflicts play in Papua New Guinea. Um, but we can also see that interstate tensions in the region are increasing. The Mekong River is, um, is, a, is one example, but also, for example, fisheries in the Bay of Bengal. Um, and if we think about this risk, it's also important to not just look um, at those instances where we already see clear tensions, clear cases um, of violence. Um, and one example are here um, urban centers, um, especially coastal mega cities in the Asia Pacific region. Um, they will be under increasing pressure. They already are. There's a lot of demographic pressure, so um, rural urban migration. And that is combining with economic challenges and now on top of that, um, climate change is coming. And um, these kind of urban centers really risk to become climate security hotspots, um, if, in particular, if they cannot provide um, security, if they cannot provide livelihoods and jobs for their increasing populations. Um, small island states are also particularly affected by climate change. Um, and while these states and societies are rem remarkably peaceful for now, so there's not a lot of um, Pacific Island states that are um, that are experiencing a lot of conflict and and, and violence. Um, we can also we can see already now that the scale of climate impacts are eroding social cohesion um, and cooperative norms and putting these states really under increasing pressure. And we can see that play out um, in increasing tensions over um, scarcer resources, especially land and water. Um, and, but we can also see um, other effects like criminality increasing. And we could, should really see these as warning signs um, to act preventively now. Um, and then lastly, in terms of risks, I want to talk a little bit about um, gender-based violence. That's also emerging as a key climate security risk um, across the region. We can see that, for example, in the context context of migration, displacement, and disasters where women often face much higher risks um, in terms of abuse and violence. Um, and then very, very quickly, um, I want to just talk um, a little bit about what we can do in or what we need to do to address these kind of risks. Um, and one is really scaling up um, our investment in prevention and resilience building measures, and not just focusing um, on the technical side, on the technical adaptation side, but specifically also focusing on the political and social side of adaptation, which is also largely um, neglected for now. And then um, we really need to also proactively address the systemic and multidimensional nature of climate-related security risks. So we really need to reflect the kind of complexity um, of those risks. And what that means is, um, the professor already talked about that, is kind of a whole of government approach. And we really need to break down silos between security, humanitarian development, adaptation and development sectors. And in particular, we need to link climate change adaptation with peace building and conflict prevention efforts. Um, and um, I'm happy to also talk more about that um, during our discussion if we have time. With that, I would like to hand it back. Thank you, Lucas, for covering like, many, many topics that you can already already revealing that this climate security issue involves with many like uh, issues inside and many different aspects that we should think about. So, Professor Kameyama, uh, please come in. Oh, thank you. 
Um, good afternoon or uh, good morning or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Yasuko Kameyama from University of Tokyo. My background is international relations and I kind of follow the, uh, the academic work on climate change and security for over 20 years. And uh, I had the feeling um, during those 20 years that um, uh, there are so much things going on outside of Japan, but unfortunately, this topic had been very unfamiliar to most of the Japanese people. So that is why I would like to thank the organizers for uh, holding this very important event. Um, and I'm hoping that, that this will be a kind of stimulations for the Japanese people to understand um, what this climate change and security is all about. So uh, thank you so much. And thank you so much for inviting me to this important event. Um, the, uh, I, I go into the first um, question, what are the climate security risks you think are essential? There are a lot of uh, risks that are essential, but I think Lucas has already <laughs> displayed quite a lot. So I just want to uh, really uh, um, focus on one element, and it is a relationship between, I mean, the climate change and national security because I think national security is really, really essential to the security uh, related uh, uh, debates. And uh, um, actually today, um, I feel that we don't see so much about the uh, uh, national security being uh, threatened by climate change in Asia Pacific region right now. And we see uh, more in Africa or Middle East where uh, society is unstable even without the impact of climate change. So I, I, that's my understanding, at least for today's uh, world view. But in the future, that will be uh, different. Because um, if you look at the latest IPCC reports, we can see that if this global warming continues, then uh, those countries close to equator will be uh, literally unlivable. It will be too hot and uh, everybody who are living in those regions will have to move away from the region. And that is going to be really essential for those countries and also be very essential for, for other country, neighbor com countries. And uh, I, I'm also kind of worried that um, you know, last year's global temperature was very extremely hot. It was more than 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial period. And uh, um, this year's uh, might be even hotter. I've heard from some friends who live in Switzerland and Spain that Europe is really warm, like 20 degrees warmer than usual. And that's really um, uh, extraordinary. So um, I really have a concern that that kind of um, um, threat might really come suddenly because uh, climate change or global warming due to uh, um, global warming gases comes gradual. But on top of it, you have natural extreme uh, hot weather or uh, extremely uh, cold weather that might really change the dynamics of uh, people's livelihood. So, so that's my uh, biggest concern. And uh, I'm also worried from a security point of view that uh, when that happens in uh, Asia Pacific region and people start moving to other places, then those countries might um, shut down the border. Um, if, for, and you know, so that those people will not come into their countries. And then that is going to be a very serious uh, security related issue. And um, that's the point I want to make in this panel at this moment. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Kamiyama, especially uh, putting this uh, in my view, the long term perspective, whether you know, once the climate change impacts deepened compared to now, then the risk really appeared quite suddenly as we already saw in a European context. And that's a really important point to start debating about this issue in the Asia Pacific region, I believe. 
So, uh, Professor Tokuchi, I think uh, you, I requested you to make a keynote speech. So you might have already made uh, most of the points that you or you wanted to make. But still, uh, if you have any additional insights on this uh, question, please. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity as well. Well, um, if I remember correctly, uh, around a decade ago, uh, the then uh, U.S. Uh, the commander of the U.S. PACOM, I mean the, the commander of the U.S. Pacific Command, now uh, the Indo-Pacific Command, uh, some uh, Admiral Samuel Lokuria uh, said uh, in response to a newspaper uh, interview that the most serious security challenge in this region for the United States is climate change. And hearing that, uh, many of the Japanese security experts were surprised. Actually, at that time, we expected that he would say that China or North Korea uh, would be the biggest challenge. But instead, he said climate change was uh, the uh, biggest challenge. Uh, uh, in the Indo-Pacific, or at that time, actually, he said, uh, yeah, Asia-Pacific, but, but um, you know, so we are very much surprised. But in fact, uh, uh, he was right. He was, as you correctly uh, said, that uh, the climate change uh, brought uh, instability uh, in this region, and also, you know, uh, in other things. So, uh, the, uh, I think, that our recognition on the importance to address climate change is increasing, but still um, it is in a very, um, as I said, you know, primitive stage or early stage. So we have to enhance our uh, you know, awareness of the importance of this issue. So from this point of view, I think that a holistic approach uh, to address climate change and also, uh, you know, promotion of scientific knowledge among the uh, you know public. Uh, these two things are very, very important. Thank you. I do agree that this are uh, public awareness is quite key to also this topic. So, Professor Michael Melling, uh, please provide insights to this last question. Thank you. So likewise, from my side, thank you very much for the invitation and opportunity to be here. And um, I'll take a slightly different angle based on my own work and research to the security topic. I'm not going to look as so much on how the impacts of climate change result in compounding security risks, but rather on how the political responses of countries lead to some of the security laden challenges that uh, Professor Tkuchi already um, insinuated before, the, the growing challenge of bridging between confrontation and cooperation. And I think the Asia Pacific region is at the very center of this, um, let's say, shifting paradigm globally because of the trade flows and manufacturing capacities that are so strongly currently concentrated in the region. Um, and I'll shift back about a year ago in Washington, DC, where I used to live, Two speeches by Secretary Yellen of the Treasury and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan essentially were somewhat under the radar screen, suggesting that the United States was redefining 80 years of its vision of what the international economic order should be, listing a whole bunch of aspects, like unintended effects and outcomes of 80 years of trade liberalization, enhanced integration, economic integration, and cooperation that had to be addressed and that necessitated sort of a reevaluation of how the US and its allies position themselves in international economic cooperation. That in itself is, of course, staggering that there's such a you know redefinition from, from the largest economy in the world and still the largest political, if you like, actor. Um, but what was very interesting about that is that certain aspects of this enjoyed broad bipartisan support in the United States and have also enjoyed somewhat more hesitant and in some cases more nuanced, but still support in parts of the world like Europe, the UK, um, Australia, et cetera. So first that, and the second thing that's also very interesting is how climate and in particular decarbonization is woven into this redefinition of economic cooperation 
in ways that really use trade, use the green agenda, if you like, green transformation, almost as a weapon, as a tool, also to advance geopolitical and security interests. There's two dimensions of this uh, that I want to briefly address. The first one is the energy transition. The second one is the industrial transition. On the energy transition side, we can see that there is a fairly confrontational, <laughs> there's cooperation, efforts at cooperation, but they're not proving so successful. But there's a fairly confrontational, zero-sum game sort of mindset in positioning countries such as the United States, the European Union, but of course China, on the other side, and other countries around the world um, as leaders in manufacturing the technologies that are seen as technologies of the future with heavy industrial policy um, deployment, subsidies in particular, a turn to industrial policy and a approach to policies that only a few years ago were still considered you know, anathema has now become almost mainstream. So again, very com competitive and quite confrontational. But of course, energy security is an essential part of this discussion as well. So whereas you know, in the past, energy security immediately made one think of geopolitics and the need to sort of um, navigate the geopolitics of fossil fuels, this is now shifting this mindset to the geopolitics of the clean energy technologies. And in particular there, you know, as Germany, for instance, as the European Union a year and a half ago when Russia invaded Ukraine, was faced with the sudden energy security challenges, availability, reliability, affordability of energy, when its main trade partner on oil, gas, and coal, 25% of coal, going into the EU, 50% roughly of gas, 50% of oil, was shut off, was cut off. Now the concern is that we're entering new dependencies, dependencies on critical minerals, critical raw materials, rare earth metals, components like solar cells, wafers, et cetera. And there, um, again, it's it's sort of a, a, um, a very complex picture. China dominates all of the supply chains on these components and materials, so like 60% of the production, 85% of the processing across the board of clean energy technologies, supply chains. And there's a race underway to de-risk those supply chains, to become more independent from China. Um, French-shoring, de-risking, relocalizing industries, again, with industrial policy, like in the US, the Inflation Reduction Act, in the EU, the Net Zero Industry Act. And it's happening very fast. It's incredible how fast, for instance, manufacturing of clean technologies is being onshored again in the United States. But there's a risk at this uh, in, in, in the process. There is efforts to cooperate on French shoring to have sort of allies work together on critical raw materials. But for instance, the US and the EU are having quite a difficult um, challenge in agreeing on exactly how to do that. Just last week, I think, or two weeks ago, the Trade and Technology Council between the US and the EU tried to make progress on the issues that didn't succeed. Happily, Japan and the United States have been able to agree on a critical raw materials treaty. Um, but again, it's not so easy. There's a lot of challenges there. The second one was industrial decarbonization, industrial transition. And why I think there's a security angle to that is the fact that these industries are absolutely essential to the defense industry and to the national security of countries. Think of steel, think of other metals like aluminum, think of chemicals, et cetera. And again, here too, China dominates the market. Within the last 20 years, it's grown to be the largest producer of steel, aluminum, and many other bulk industrial goods. Um, we've seen production and output in, from European industry decline, from North American industry. And I would suspect that if we looked at Japanese output and trade flows, it's not that different. And so here too, there are policy responses that again are having a lot of intended, but also potentially quite a few unintended effects. Some of those responses, I think you're very familiar with. The EU has now operationalized and um, um, put into effect the carbon border adjustment mechanism on six industrial commodities, including steel, including aluminum. In the US, there have been numerous um, bills that have been introduced in both the Senate and the House, also on tariffs to sort of, again, weaponize trade with a green agenda, with a green over, let's say, überbau, but at the same time, it's very clear that these also advance geopolitical interests. And again, cooperation on these topics has proven extremely difficult. So the US and the EU, for instance, launched in 2021 an effort to have a global arrangement of sustainable steel and aluminum that was supposed to be concluded last October. They did not succeed. The topics, the policies are so contingent, so specific to the context, the political context, the stakeholders, the 
just divisive politics around this, um, that it's been incredibly difficult for any one jurisdiction to sort of concede, um, you know, how it wants to approach the topic in order to have some sort of agreement. Um, so on two fronts, energy transition and industrial transition, a lot of security implications, extremely difficult to find space for cooperation. And I think for researchers that begs the question, how do we identify sort of the lowest common denominators in which countries can, in which jurisdictions can potentially approach each other and come to cooperative solutions? I think it's very important because if not, we risk fragmenting the global economy and that will slow us down also in decarbonization and in meeting the climate challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your insights. Indeed, like energy, energy transition and industry transition is like one of the most important topics that we also consider in the, as a part of our project on climate security and a later thematic discussion one will really dig into that topic as well. Okay, so last but not least, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Serizawa from UNDP and I think he kindly prepared a PowerPoint on this point and the later point. So do you, okay, thank you. So Serizawa, for as yours. Thank you so much. Uh, so my name is Tomokazu Serizawa. I'm a climate security specialist uh, for uh, UNDP, Asian Pacific region, and uh, I'm based in Bangkok. So. Yeah, uh, so I think, uh, um, this, uh, let me start with the definition of the climate security. This is not like UN official definition, but uh, I found it very much straightforward and also easy to understand and get to the points. And I think it serves for uh, my discussion today. Uh, I'm not uh, against uh, any any uh, remarks the previous panel panelists actually made. Uh, I, I believe that the national security and international security as a core of the discussion of the climate security, but we shouldn't forget human security dimension in a national, uh, sorry, climate security discussion. And especially human security consists of the seven elements, economic, food, health, environmental, personal, community, and political. And any research and programming uh, shouldn't forget, should inc incorporate these elements uh, as much as possible. That's what we are uh, taking on. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I, I finished this slide. Maybe next. Yes. So this map indicates basically like climate security risk uh, uh, by color. And the dark color means that basically the more, I mean, human security as well as climate security. And obviously Africa is dark and darker than any other regions. But uh, when it comes to Asia and the Pacific, some countries are equally dark. And in fact, the Asia and the Pacific is quite vulnerable to climate changes. Six, six countries actually are listed according to Global uh, Climate Risk Index among the top 10 countries. And of course, needless to say, 50% of the global population live in this region with long coastlines, uh, industries, and uh, supply chain. And also low-lying you know, islands and uh, areas, which are all vulnerable to sea level rise as well as like uh, uh, flooding, typhoons, etc. And for, don't forget that another big concern is melting uh, Himalayan uh, glaciers. Uh, water coming from the glacier, I mean, the Himalayan region uh, actually serve for uh, sub water for almost 2 billion people. And if something happened, I mean, the water dry up or whatever, these people will suffer a lot, and uh, this will be a global crisis. And uh, Asia and the Pacific is, is not only the victims of climate security challenges, but also actually responsible for that. 
And in fact, almost 50% uh, of the uh, so-called greenhouse gas emissions this region accounts for. And through the, our UNDP assessment in, at country level, uh, we are witnessing nexus of climate impacts, uh, displacement, and uh, so-called violence or violent uh, extremists in some countries. So we are worried about this uh, trend to be expanded. So in order to address these concerns, uh, we established, I mean, within the UN system, established a CSM climate security mechanism. And uh, uh, among four agencies, DPPA, DPO, UNEP, and UNDP. Initial idea was to actually strengthen the UN's capacity to address the climate security challenges. But also, actually, the scope of work is expanding nowadays, and uh, we are engaged with, like, uh, for instance, advocacy, partnership with external partners, uh, knowledge uh, products, as well as uh, support to analysis and action in, uh, in the field. So this map indicates, actually, this CSM's work in, in, uh, glo in globally. And uh, yeah, started uh, mainly around African continent, but gradually now nowadays expanding to other regions. And in this region, Philippines uh, have been selected as a pilot country. And apart from this CSM mechanism, uh, mechanism UNDP and IOM, uh, funded by Peace Building Fund, started climate security projects in the Pacific. Also, UNDP country offices started the so-called climate security assessment or developing the concept notes in those countries. At regional level, uh, UN and ASEAN uh, jointly actually organized a dialogue on climate peace and security just uh, two months ago in November 2023 in Jakarta. And uh, next steps, as the next steps, we are aiming at uh, policy development strategy development and action plan jointly with ASEAN Secretariat. Astopia, thank you. Yeah, thanks, and actually there, this is the, <laughs> no, you can keep the purple slide actually. Um, this is the second question that we can really jump in. Um, okay, thank you for all the, all the panelists to share their insights on this uh, first question, namely, what are the essential climate security risks and what kind of actions we can take? So basically, it's a very basic and most important question. And returning to the kind of second, uh, second round of this uh, panel, which really goes into the uh, discussion about how research community can contribute to these climate security challenges. So actually, this symposium marks the first the end of the first year of the IGES initiative on the climate security research, and this continues in coming two years. And the key point of our project is to provide a policy recommendation at the end of the project so that not just Japan, but also the Asia Pacific region can better respond to this climate security challenge. So for one of the pur side purpose of this uh, second question is to get insight about what we should do in a, in a second, third year, then what is a good, good and ideal and our biggest challenges that researchers, researchers should engage with in this climate security research. So, and I'd like to make the opposite direction so that you can pre first, <laughs> first person privilege, you can enjoy the first person privilege and the Lucas can <laughs> take the last one. Okay, so Serida san please uh, actually continue with her. Thank you. All right, so regarding the research and research institute, uh, yeah, we have a strong uh, expectation actually uh, they can play in this field. But uh, I, I want to draw, uh, draw some attention to some uh, attempt or failed attempt actually uh, at the global stage uh, on the climate security because this, this gives us a lot of actually lesson learned from it. Uh, Actually, Security Council, UN Security Council, uh, uh, already adopted several resolutions, if, I, if my understanding is correct, uh, around five or six since 2007, and all focus on Africa, 
specific. And, but this is a great steps, I think, achieved. But then in 2021, the Security Council, actually mem some of the member states attempted to uh, uh, actually uh, raise this uh, so-called climate security focus resolution. It was drafted, discussed, but eventually vetoed by Russia and some countries actually supported Russia's move. And what they said, why, why they actually uh, you know, oppose, the main reason was the lack of data, lack of scientific like evidences on the linkages between climate changes and the security issues. And they said that actually, uh, you know, um, unless these uh, uh, interlinkages between these issues are proven, then the, these issues, climate change or climate security, so-called climate security issues, should be addressed at the technical level. Uh, so what we learn from this experience, and basically more evidences should be uh, you know, provided through research or by research institutes. So I, I don't go into detail, but already some actual institutes produce very interesting reports on climate security in ASEAN region, uh, Pacific, uh, Himalayan region, and UNDP country offices also producing uh, reports. And the institutes we are we have been collaborated uh, collaborating with uh, are Adelphi, Cipri, Nupi, and they are also producing excellent uh, reports. Uh, but uh, mainly on Africa and the Middle East, and I think we, we really need to more research. We need to produce more research in this region. Lastly, um, yeah, uh, my proposal for research or researchers so-called national development and national security strategy should be provided with more research uh, you know, uh, results and uh, help concretize actions. NDC, NLP also need more lenses of uh, climate security. And actually some of them already adopted, but more I think NDCs and NLPs should adapt it. Uh, networking among institutes in this region, uh, I highly recommend this, and uh, UNDP ready to uh, you know support. And developing a CS climate security risk indicator, this is I think an in interesting entry point. UNDP and the institutes can work together. And lastly, climate security forecasting model, we are trying to develop this and the data on climate vulnerability, displacement, whatever data relevant to climate security should be collected maybe jointly with the Institute and UNDP. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Serena, also for the encouragement to engage better with the UNDP and other uh, institutions in this region. So, Michael, please come in. Thank you again. Um, and I think I already borrowed some time from this slide by ending with a few thoughts about research. I'll expand a bit, but I, I'll, I'll hopefully not use up uh, my time. Um, I'll speak very specifically to the dimension of security that I was describing earlier. So not you know, the hugely important topics that my fellow panelists have addressed. That one is marked, I find, by greater sensitivity to some extent and stronger sense of national interest, which makes it so much harder to talk about cooperation, to think about you know, how research might help bridge some of the challenges, some of the potential confrontational, um, yeah, challenges that we will face further down the road. And I think it's very important also to be aware that there is no one size fits all solution to this problem. So the, the topics are so closely interwoven with the domestic politics in each jurisdiction, in each economy, that one cannot think of them in abstract. So I think for research to be effective um, and to, to, to have a chance to sort of influence the course of future interaction towards cooperation rather than confrontation. Um, it has to be very close to policymaking in each jurisdiction, which is very difficult, very challenging. It cannot be too academic because then it proves not to have any chance of implementation. There are some cooperative research projects on this energy security and industrial policy um, nexus, but they tend to be rather, let's say, removed from the policy. The second thing that I think has to happen, it shouldn't be only between allies. It shouldn't be just North America, Europe, Japan, thinking about how to deal with this. It has to expand and reach out 
especially to the global south, um, in order to be meaningful, because those are the countries that also will suffer many of the consequences of changed trade, changed economic cooperation policies. And finally, eventually, we have to find also an answer to the dilemma of how, whether and how we engage countries like China, even Russia, because we cannot leave them out entirely from the discussion. I don't have an answer to how to do that, but we will have to get to that at some point. Thank you for those points. Uh, Sensei, please. Well, uh, thank you. Um, you know, my neighbor, Professor uh, Kamiyama, uh, said a few years ago that uh, the Japanese policymakers must pay attention to the fact that they were indifferent to the uh, policy trend on climate security in the international community until very recently. And uh, not only environmental policy experts, but also uh, national security policymakers should have more attention to the uh, policy trend in the international community. And in fact, the, uh, for example, the, the United States uh, Department of Defense, even under President Trump, uh, were, uh, was uh, promoting uh, climate uh, security policy. And uh, I think that uh, the Japanese government was not necessarily uh, interested in it. So it's a very unfortunate issue. And related to this issue, uh, my friend, uh, Professor Sekiyama over there, uh, argued a few years ago that the scarcity of systemic uh, research on climate security has affected policy progress uh, in Japan. And if so, uh, Japan's international cooperation on policy study on climate security must be promoted to uh, promote uh, climate security policy in this country. Thank you again. So, Professor Kameyama, please. Thank you. Um, I would like to echo what Fukuchi sensei said at the begin at the end of his uh, initial presentation that the increase to increase people's uh, awareness of a climate change is very, very important. And in addition to that, I would also like to say that uh, we need to uh, um, let I mean, inform the people that climate change is related to security. And uh, uh, so nowadays, people are aware about floods, but they don't have the idea that flood is related to climate change. And also, they are not related to security dimension of climate change. Same for what Michael has uh, kindly mentioned about the mitigation policies. Um, recently, the Japanese industry started saying, oh, green transformation, emission reduction, net zero finance. And they are going out as a business but they don't really have the idea that uh, it has a kind of implication for security. So I think uh, when you go out to the people and tell them about climate change, I think there needs to be a way to inform the people. And as a, 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 a expert who has a background in social science, communication is getting very, very difficult these days because people no more watch TV, TV news or read uh, newspaper articles, and they only watch uh, smartphone, SNS news, and it's getting more and more difficult for them, uh, for us to get in touch with the, the lay people. I mean, who has uh, only a little uh, um, um, uh, interest in, in climate change and, and what is going on in the reality. So I, I, I hope that the researchers uh, will tackle this very important uh, problem. Thank you. Thank you so much for this point. And indeed, and one we're, we're hopeful that more than 500 people registered to this symposium, and we like to continue the outreaching and advertisement of our research, not just doing research itself, but rather try to outreach and engage with uh, ordinary people more and more. So thank you for the point. So Lucas. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I think I want to start with underlining the point that Tomakasa made that the Asia Pacific region in terms of climate security is an under-researched region, especially compared to Africa or the Middle East. So there is really a need to, to deepen my, our understanding on a regional level, but also particular on a local and national level. Um, and I think Tomakas also kind of showed some, some first analysis. Um, and um, I think to be 
policy oriented this kind of analysis has to be done together and in cooperation with governments and regional bodies and for example as part of our weathering risk initiative um, we do work together with uh, the UNDP and IOM and the Pacific Island Forum um, a first set of national climate security assessments for atoll nations and then develop based on that um, a regional climate security risk assessment framework for the Pacific that can be used by the Pacific Islands and to better understand these risks. And then kind of to inform policy, this kind of research has to be action oriented. And what that means is that we not just look at the risks, but also on possible responses. So to kind of convince policymakers, so first we need to convince them of the risks, but we also need to provide them with practical solutions. So for example, how do integrated climate change adaptation and peace building measures look like? So our solution narratives and kind of case studies on the solution side have to be as convincing as our risk analysis um, in that regard. Um, and um, to better really su support policies and debates, we as researchers also need to use our research to amplify um, the voices of those who are the most affected and vulnerable to climate security risks. And that means that with our research, we really need to reach those communities and groups, even if it's very difficult and if it's in very difficult contexts. And then one last quick point is then, if we think about informing the broader policy debate, there's a general development towards broadening the climate security agenda to encompass the whole environment security nexus. So what that means is not excluding other environmental issues, for example, pollution and biodiversity loss. And we can see that, for example, in the Climate for Peace initiative that's spearheaded by the G7 um, to advance climate security, the climate security agenda globally, um, and action on the ground on that, it specifically includes biodiversity loss and environmental degradation more broadly. And I think we should keep that into in, in mind when we think about informing the broader policy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the insight. And indeed, Adelphi is one of the leading institutions to engage policymakers, not just with your climate security research, but try to mobilize the people to this action. So thank you. And with that, that concludes our first plenary session. Thank you so much. That was a great start of the day. And I appreciate your coming to coming here and for your insights. So please give a big hand to our panelists. And I give back the microphone to the Katsuki san This panel has indeed put forward a very important background and viewpoint. From now on, there will be a break. Zoom will remain open during the break. We will resume at 2.20 Japan time. Thank you. Now we resume the symposium. The next agenda, next agenda item is thematic discussion one, climate mitigation, resource diplomacy, and geopolitics. Dr. Kentaro Nakamura, Dr. Kentaro Tamura, Program Director, Climate and Energy Area of IGES, will moderate the discussion. Dr. Tamura, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Kentaro Tamura, uh, from a program director of uh, climate and energy area of IGES. So thank you very much for gathering for this uh, session. So I'll be the chair of this session. So this session, as you know, that consists of three keywords, uh, climate mitigation, resource diplomacy, and geopolitics. So as the early session, we already discussed, these three keywords are closely interlinked. So global effort 
toward decarbonization is a shift away from fossil fuel. And fossil, a uh, shift away for, from fossil fuel uh, had huge implication for resource dip dip diplomacy. Uh, this is because, as uh, Michael uh, pointed out uh, earlier session, the type of strategic resources will change, and the country that produce such resources also change. So these changes uh, uh, bring new challenges as well uh, to energy security or economic security uh, resonating with geopolitical issues such as a strained US-China relations and Russian wars and Ukraine and so on. So understanding these complex or uh, complex changes that decarbonization effort to bring about is essential to Asian countries' uh, resource diplomacy, and in particular in Japan as well. So against this background, we organized this session, and I'm very much pleased to have a three distinguished speakers to discuss these to hot topics. First, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Jane Nakano. Uh, she is a senior fellow in the Energy Security and Climate Change Program at the Center for Strategic and International uh, Studies. Her research interests include U.S. energy policy, energy geopolitics, and energy securities. And the second speaker, uh, Dr. Kapil Narula. Uh, he, he is a senior analyst at the Climate Champion Team, UNCCC. So he is uh, in charge of a breakthrough agenda report. Uh, this report is a joint product of IEA, IRENA, and the UN High Level Champion, uh, Climate Champion, to assess international cooperation in the critical sectors. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, Dr. Nandakumar Janardhan. Uh, he is a deputy director of uh, climate and energy area of IGES. So his expertise including energy security and the clean technology transfer and the deployment, hydrogen and the critical mineral. Now he is uh, contributing the UNEP uh, flagship report, GEO7, on the uh, chapter on the critical mineral. So we have distinguished speakers to discuss one. So first, uh, we start with some initial statement by speakers, uh, around seven minutes for each. And after that, I will give some guiding question to each speakers. So then I'd like to uh, ask the Jen Sam uh, so her initial statements. So Dr. Jen Nakano, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Dr. Tamura, and uh, thank you to the IGES colleagues for having me. The world needs to rapidly reduce the greenhouse gas emissions in order to mitigate the worst effects of the climate change. Many countries around the world, including in Asia, are facilitating this energy transition efforts. And a key approach here is uh, you know, to deploy clean energy technologies like wind, like EVs, like hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Uh, for example, at the recent COP meeting, COP28 in Dubai, one of the important pledges was uh, for the, the world to triple the renewable capacity uh, between now and 2030. Um, and you know, a lot of signatories to this pledge included Asian countries, including Japan, South Korea, Singapore, and Thailand. Um, also, the clean energy vehicles has been really uh, getting more attention, and uh, it's you know, some of the governments are starting to ban uh, the, the sale of the internal combustion engines. Uh, many in uh, Europe are you know, pursuing that or considering that. Um, but you know, what's really interesting is, or important to know is that these clean energy technologies and also the production method for some of the low carbon fuels like hydrogen require mineral resources. Uh, you know, lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese, and graphite are essential for battery performance. And renew um, the rare earth elements uh, are crucial to permanent manganese that are used in wind turbines and EV motors. Um, and others like iridium and platinum are also important for uh, electrolyzers, which is the key apparatus for hydrogen production, mainly by you know, splitting water into oxygen and hydrogen. And you know, clearly the world needs more of these minerals. Um, according to the International Energy Agency, between 2017 and 2022, 
the overall demand grew by 300% for lithium, 70% for cobalt, and 40% for nickel. And that type of growth is expected to continue. And under the EIA, uh, I'm sorry, IEA scenario, uh, where national pledges uh, by countries are met, uh, the you know the demand for critical minerals more than double uh, doubles uh, between now and 2030. But meeting these mineral demand for energy transition is not just a question of quantity. Another important consideration is where they come from. Critical mineral resources exist in many countries around the world, but the actual extraction is much more concentrated than the extraction of oil and gas uh, resources. And moreover, minerals in the extracted state uh, does not really have the immediate value and they need to be refined and processed. And today, uh, the global supply chains for minerals, particularly at the processing state, is highly dominated by one country, China. Um, and for example, Australia accounts for about half of the global lithium extraction, but China accounts for almost 60% of the processing. Um, and similar things are could be said about many other minerals. Um, so, you know, the, the need to diversify these supply chains elevates the importance of resource diplomacy and diplomatic engagements with countries that are rich with these resources. Um, additionally, uh, I wanted to just also note that, you know, there's also a separate resource diplomacy concern in hydrogen economy too. Um, as important as hydrogen could be for decarbonization, Countries um, that lack competitively priced feedstock for domestic hydrogen production, um, whether it's natural gas or renewable energy, uh, how and from where to secure the supply of hydrogen uh, and its vectors like ammonia is a rising agenda. Now, quickly, uh, I wanted to just you know talk about how the United States is trying to achieve uh, or advance uh, these um, agenda and address concerns. You know, the prevailing view in the United States is that for these clean, uh, clean energy technologies to thrive, uh, it's important to diversify the global supply chains by focusing on uh, domestic mining and processing capacities because we are rich in uh, natural resources, but then also R&D for substitutions, also international cooperation and trade measures are very important. Um, and under the recent US laws that pass uh, the Congress, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act uh, that passed the Congress in November 2021 uh, appropriates about $8 billion for uh, clean energy technology supply chains, including uh, for battery material processing and uh, manufacturing and recycling. The other key law is the Inflation Reductions Act uh, that passed the Congress in August 2022. And this one also includes huge funding including tax uh, consumer tax credits uh, to uh, facilitate the uh, EV mineral um, manufacture um, extraction, but then also processing uh, in the United States and some of the key uh, partner countries. And just also, I wanted to note that out of the executive branch, the White House, uh, the US has also launched uh, resource diplomacy uh, with mineral rich countries around the world. Uh, the multilateral ones uh, are, um, you know, mainly through the uh, the global infrastructure, but the partnership for global infrastructure and investment, and the other one is the mineral uh, security partnership. Under each of these um, partnerships, the United States is trying to engage resource-rich countries, whether from the uh, infrastructure perspective or. Uh, more of a mineral extraction, but with the ESG, environmental, sustainability, and governance perspectives at the at their core. I think there are a lot of implications for partners um, in allied countries such as Japan, and I very much look forward to uh, exchanging my views with colleagues and the audience. Thank you so much. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Jen San, for providing, providing us some overview of current uh, resource diplomacy and also some hint for international collaboration. Uh, thank you very much. So now I would like to make, uh, next, uh, move to the next speaker, Kapil San. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope you can hear me well. And uh, thank you for the ideas to invite me for this important session. 
Uh, I'll start by just taking a step back and trying to uh, understand uh, that how is climate change impacting countries? And we recently had the global risk report uh, from the World Economic Forum, and there the increasing risks from climate change, both from, uh, from uh, extreme weather events, actually ranked uh, the first in both short as well as long-term uh, uh, time horizon. So that is in year 2024 and in five years ahead and 10 years ahead. So uh, this climate change therefore is could also have a multiplier effect and uh, leading to instability and economic disruptions. And this exactly will reflect an increased burden on national security and development. But uh, these increasing physical risks of which we are aware, uh, which, which actually can be both acute and chronic, clearly affect geography as well as ecosystems. The chronic risks, uh, of course, includes the risk to territorial integrity for, uh, for example, for small island developing countries, which leading to displacement or migration, uh, including we've heard of uh, sea level rise, uh, which is threatening livelihoods of coastal population in Bangladesh, for example, leading to economic impacts. But there's also saltwater intrusion uh, impacting uh, delta farming patterns in Egypt, uh, which can lead to resource security. On the other hand, the short term risks, which are acute risks from uh, weather events, extreme weather events, are leading to damage to infrastructure, which cuts across all countries, be it developing or developed. But apart from these physical risks, you know, there are also a set of high transition risks, which include both policy, legal, technology risks, market risks, as well as reputation risks. And these uh, risks, including both physical and transition, they are leading to actually financial risks, which is reflected in form of credit risk, operational risk, and liquidity risks through the economic transmission channels and affect businesses, households, and therefore countries. And that's the entire uh, universe of risks which the climate uh, change brings. So the, the second point I would like to uh, make here is that uh, you know, through these risks, uh, there is a significant impact of climate change, both internally as well as externally. And we know that uh, energy policy and fossil fuels shaped actually foreign policy in the last century. But now, as we see, uh, the, a new green image and climate diplomacy are now shaping international relations. And the most evident proof of this is uh, what happened at COP28, where under the UAE presidency, which is a resource-rich country, uh, globally countries came together and agreed for a transition away from fossil fuels. So that's, that's how it's shaping international world order, but climate policy is also determining internal politics. And if you note, uh, there's a rebellion against uh, the European Green Deal, which is now escalating across Europe with widespread disten uh, discontent. And amidst this, uh, the EU, EU has now proposed a bold new target of a 90% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2040. And uh, it, it needs to be seen how it's going to impact uh, internal European politics. Moving on from here, um, I think how I see that mitigation actions are actually leading to transforming the global energy system. And some of its impact could be as follows that first it's leading to a redistribution of both internal spending and investment flows. And that's evident uh, when we see that net zero goals have been adopted and announced by Japan for 2050, China for 2060 and India for 2070. We also see other countries uh, and, and the Just Energy Transition Partnerships, which are looking at decommissioning coal-fired plants in uh, Indonesia, Vietnam and other countries. So what this is shaping is that the global investment in low carbon transition has actually surged to 17% now to its highest to about 1.5 trillion in 2023. But still this needs to be triple uh, per year between now and 2030 to meet the net zero goals. So we'll see a lot of investment coming in uh, uh, in low carbon energy transition technologies. 
However, I would like to also point out that investment flows in clean energy uh, only on the supply side, I'm not talking on the demand side, was about 1 trillion, but it was still lower than uh, the fossil fuel supply investment even today. And that uh, is the reality of uh, the energy transition scenario. And what it is doing, it's, it's redistributing uh, geopolitical power. And clearly you see that oil importers, uh, such as uh, you know, EU and China, who are lowering their dependence on energy imports, uh, are emerging out of uh, this import dependency and will emerge as winners from this transition. On the other hand, you see fossil fuel exporters, uh, such as the Middle East, Russia, there is clearly a loss of global influence and there's a high risk of stranded assets for them. In fact, Saudi Arabia recently decided to abandon its uh, plans to increase oil production capacity uh, by 2027. <clears throat> and the third is that uh, mineral exporters such as Australia, uh, Canada, some countries in uh, Africa, uh, it's, it's resulting in higher revenues for them, but also along with that comes uh, environmental risks, uh, social impacts and increase of conflict in these areas. The third point which I would like to make uh, is there's a, in, I see an increased trend of a fragmented and polarized world where competition is actually replacing cooperation. And uh, Jane touched upon the increasing resource scarcity and competition for critical minerals. Uh, <clears throat> And, and there is increased evidence of, uh, of investments flowing in uh, through several sources uh, from government in the US and uh, also in, in the uh, EU. Uh, the German government recently marked about 1 billion uh, for raw material investment. Uh, this is also leading to confrontation. Uh, you know, we saw that China has banned export of rare earth extraction and separation technologies. Uh, as late as, uh, you know, about two months ago in December 23, which was actually in response to the US and allies banning export of semiconductors and advanced chips and tools in September 23. So it's, it's leading to some kind of uh, a conflict situation also. Uh, I would also like to say that, you know, it's, it's leading to increased barriers, which are actually triggered by carbon pricing, uh, which is undermining trade, such as trade of green steel and uh, CBAM in the EU. And lastly, in uh, 30 seconds, I'll talk of the examples of cooperation and the breakthrough agenda itself uh, has a goal to, you know, make clean energy technologies and sustainable solutions the most affordable accessible and attractive option in major emitting sectors by 2030. And an evidence of that is the Buildings Breakthrough, which was launched uh, at COP, uh, and, and now 80 countries are participating in a global conference on buildings and construction led by France. Uh, and there's also uh, certain COP decisions, the Global Renewable Energy Pledge and Energy Efficiency Pledge, uh, signed by 123 countries now, establishment of loss and damage fund, et cetera, which are emerging as clear examples of cooperation. So I'll stop here with my initial remarks and hand you over the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Parisam. Okay, so next I'd like to ask uh, Nandusam to make some opening uh, initial statement. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a small presentation to share with the audience. <clears throat> Next slide. The, the kind of urgency which uh, we have been probably ignoring or not realizing is something uh, a bit scary to the entire world. And uh, many of the studies, many projections have already showed that we are moving uh, much faster than we have expected to 1.5 or 2 degree goals. Next slide. And uh, so this demands that there is an urgent need of transition. And this transition also brings in new dimensions to the geopolitics of, uh, including the geopolitics of uh, resource diplomacy, especially if you look at uh, uh, the kind of uh, resources that are required or the kind of policies that 
the globe, the world needs in terms of addressing climate change. My previous panelists have already outlined those uh, elements. And uh, so there are newer dimensions emerging. But the most important element here is that uh, when we talk about resource diplomacy, conventional resource diplomacy that has been followed by different countries have been mostly uh, relaying on the fossil fuel sector. If you, if you uh, check, uh, the, traditionally, most of the countries, import-dependent countries, have their own mechanisms they have developed over years to how to deal with the fossil fuel supplying countries. But the new dimension, which is uh, as an outcome of the energy transition, as it demands newer sources, uh, not only fuel materials, but also sort of critical minerals. And this is a sort of a, a newer area where countries will have to deal with. Next slide. And this transition is driven by technology and is mineral intensive. Uh, Jane and Kapil has already have already outlined uh, these elements, so I will not go much detail much uh, detail into that. Next slide. But the fact that these demand for critical mineral and the demand for advanced technology are bringing a lot of challenges that uh, countries will be forced to deal with. First of all, spillover. Uh, when you talk about extracting resources from other countries to, to advance your energy transition, there is a critical aspect is about the kind of adverse environmental and social impacts these processes are leading to. And also there are concerns about trade of technology. Which country has advanced technology, whether it is uh, accessible to other countries, and uh, also there are uh, concerns about uh, flow of finance. And uh, finance is some sort of a basis for uh, any sort of energy transition which we are looking at. Uh, thanks a couple for mentioning those aspects on, on finance. Next slide. Now, the challenge before Asia is how we are going to adapt to this evolving landscape. We have been talking about diversification as a key, and basically diversification of energy resources, diversification of uh, supply sources, but to what extent this diversification must work? That's an important question uh, to uh, the Asian economies. Probably what is more important for Japan and the Asian countries is to think of definitely investing in renewable energy technologies, but also sort of forging partnership, stronger collaboration within Asia to jointly uh, develop technologies and also uh, collaborating with countries that are able to uh, bring in advances in renewable energy technologies. So that sort of uh, collaboration has to be developed. Probably this will go against the conventional debate of uh, geopolitics because we will have to think of, uh, I mean, so this is actually a common objective for the entire Asia. And it is very important for countries to probably ignore or probably overcome the differences that separate the countries and work together. If I bring in one example here, uh, we often hear the question of China having a bigger a set of resources with them. But at the same time, that's a reality. China has resources and uh, they're, uh, uh, they're one of the leading uh, uh, countries which is having the processing capacity. They have uh, uh, resources, uh, they have actually like sort of ownership of uh, a significant share of critical, uh, critical uh, mineral resources. So the fact that this is a fact and which uh, countries will have to understand and also sort of have to work towards a partnership, ignoring any of those differences. Next slide. So probably I would like to, uh, I wanted to actually highlight three important words, especially for Japan and for the rest of Asia. This is uh, vision, agility, and collaboration. Japan will have to uh, think of a future, considering that, considering the limitations Japan has in terms of development of renewable energy, 
considering its uh, dependence on fossil fuel. So a sort of a vision has to be developed, which will be, which will have to be sort of uh, quickly set and we'll have to uh, also bring in partnerships within Asia so that uh, a better future for Asia can be planned. Thank you so much. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Nandasan, some highlighting some uh, really interesting issues and also important some international partnership, uh, particularly uh, vision development and also with agility and for the collaboration. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much for the, all the three speakers. Then I'd like to move on to some panel, uh, some guiding questions. So could you uh, share the question? Yeah, we initially we um, prepare these uh, four questions. So first, uh, yeah. yeah, so I think I'd like to ask first question to each of the speakers. So in your view, uh, what's the contours or outline of climate security dynamics uh, shaping in the mitigation strategy of Asian countries? So this is the first question to I'd like to ask to uh, one by one. So first I'd like to uh, Jen Sang. Sure, thank you so much for the question. Uh, perhaps this is uh, in my mind, I think my comment will be less about the climate security, but perhaps it's the policy discussions around climate security. But the way I see it is that it's been the, the, the climate security uh, policy discussion dynamics have been very much driven by uh, the transatlantic stakeholders uh, for many decades. And uh, especially those that are already highly industrialized and demographically mature. So uh, in that context, uh, often I think technology solutions that consider the continued economic development and population growth are perhaps um, underlooked. Um, and also, uh, the, you know, often the debates and discussions focus so much on the feedstock um, as opposed to the negative attributes of energy resources. What I mean by that is that, um, you know, for example, when we look at the um, the potential of hydrogen, I think within Europe, the debate is much more on, you know, renewables based hydrogen are good and um, fossil fuel based, methane based are generally, um, you know, undesired uh, or you know bad. Uh, I think in some of the countries uh, in Asia. Uh, you know, the view is much more open to different uh, feed, feedstocks, so long as we can make sure that the carbon emissions are mitigated, carbons are captured, uh, and also, you know, um, measured and verified so that um, the introduction of these lower uh, emission fuels or technologies will not come at the direct competition to other priorities such as energy access and economic development. So I think that's you know, uh, how I see the, both the, you know, the contour of the climate security uh, dynamics and the mitigation strategies uh, interfacing. Okay, thank you very much. So next, uh, Kapil-san, you have the floor. Thank you, Kentaro-san. And I wanted, in response to this question, I wanted to say that you know we see that there is an increasing evidence of uh, interconnectedness of climate change with uh, geopolitical, economic, and social factors which are actually shaping uh, the climate strategies of countries towards more integrated and adaptive approaches. On the mitigation side, we clearly see that there's a shift towards low carbon pathways, and it's not limited to uh, developed countries. We see adoption of low emission development strategies, LEDs in, in several other countries, including uh, the developing ones. Uh, we also see that uh, while countries, the big emitters are adopting net zero goals, but actually this is addressing the problem of only flows. And uh, the problem of stock still remains, uh, you know, that needs to be addressed. Uh, the, the second trend which is uh, clearly evident from this is uh, that there is uh, increasing mainstreaming of adaptation. 
uh, including, you know, we see infrastructure upgrades, uh, disaster preparedness and ecosystem restoration um, to, to enhance the ability of communities and economies to withstand and recover uh, from the impact of climate change. And when we, we, we can't look at mitigation separately, we, what we see is that uh, there's policy integration happening. And actually countries are mainstreaming all these climate considerations into their sectoral policies and decision-making processes, which is leading to the adoption of integrated development approaches uh, to address climate security concerns. And that's, I think, the right way to go about it. Uh, and there are solutions which simultaneously address, uh, you know, development, climate risk, environment degradation. And this mainstreaming is actually being uh, reflected in national development plans, going on to city action plans for climate change uh, policies and investments. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much for pointing out the importance of the yeah, policy uh, integration to address this issue. Then, okay, uh, Nandusan, please. Thank you so much. Uh, so the, the the kind of challenges which we uh, encounter in Asia are sort of multifaceted and um, driven by a combination of all these issues, which includes uh, energy security and environmental impacts, uh, geopolitical risk and human uh, security issues and all. Uh, there could be like multiple pathways to address it. Uh, I would actually like to focus on one element here that uh, uh, why we need to actually consider an, uh, uh, a pathway that is, uh, I mean, instead of the traditional mitigation approach to address this climate security concerns. And this is sort of uh, uh, throwing, uh, well, basically to throw light on nature-based approaches and uh, especially giving uh, importance to uh, regenerative policies. Now, when we talk about regenerative policies, we somehow zero in our attention on agriculture policies. But regeneration has actually a wider implication and wider meaning, while sustainability looks at sort of reducing the impact on, on environment as well as the physical and economic systems. Regeneration uh, basically trying to focus on uh, enhancing the positive impacts on all these systems. So basically, we have been hearing uh, sustainable development uh, for past several decades, and it is very important for us to try and think an, a, a different approach that can instigate, that can actually sort of uh, uh, promote uh, positive actions on, on our society. So I believe there is a greater importance for us to uh, look at regenerative policies with uh, with a lot of policy with a lot of attention uh, secondly i also wanted to point out uh, the importance of a concept on uh, regional circulating and ecological uh, sphere uh, this is rces a concept that has been promoted by japan and uh, i'm proud to say that some of our senior colleagues have been working on this including professor kasuika takeuchi who is the president of iges so this concept is especially important for countries like japan where uh, we need to uh, sort of build a self resilient and self reliant and decentralized society where resources are uh, utilized within the society and also sort of uh, any sort of impacts are contained within the society. And uh, so basically like we are thinking of developing decentralized society that has the capacity to manage its uh, resources, its impacts, everything. And I believe uh, such concepts will have to be given policy attention. I mean, will have to be given attention by the policy makers. Stop here. Okay, thank you very much to bring the new idea about the concept of the regeneration policy along with the uh, sustain, traditional sustainable uh, development. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Then I'd like to move on to the next question, but uh, just due to time constraint, I'd like to combine the two and the third question. Uh, so how can Asian countries navigate the geopolitical landscape to ensure equitable access to clean energy resources and mitigate potential conflict over emerging green technologies. And the third one is, how can Japan balance geo uh, diplomacy 
in the context of increasing competition for scarce energy and uh, mineral resources. So again, con again backwards. So Nansan, could you start with uh, answering these two questions? Okay, uh, thank you so much. In fact, um, uh, Asia has a lot of uh, role to play because if you see, uh, uh, Asia has already been the epicenter of energy consumption. And um, so uh, we, I, I mean, you know, when we look at from Asia, we need to think of uh, energy as a sort of, I mean, from the concept, from the perspective of energy commons, where we need to actually think of treating energy resources as common assets or shared assets rather than sort of exclusive commodities. And this demands uh, joint action by countries across Asia. So one of the points which I mentioned earlier about development of joint technologies and uh, through sort of uh, co-innovation approaches how countries can can develop better technologies which are cost effective and can contribute to cleaner energy development so that is actually sort of a very important element for asia and uh, the fact that uh, we also actually need to uh, sort of integrate the benefits of advanced technology advanced uh, 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 technologies such as blockchain or uh, Internet of Things to sort of uh, improve the transparency and traceability of energy-related projects that are or energy-related initiatives that are happening here. So basically, Asia has a responsibility in terms of uh, uh, not only like treating energy commons and also sort of incorporating uh, uh, in, in, uh, sort of enhancing the traceability and transparency of the system. In addition, I would also like to say that uh, probably it is important for Japan to think of uh, energy diplomacy 2.0, uh, where uh, we have to actually sort of uh, basically understand the competitive advantages of each countries within the Asian region and leverage that so that we could move together towards a cleaner future. That might include nature-based solution or knowledge about nature-based solutions or uh, some of the uh, uh, expertise which China has in terms of uh, lowering the cost of technologies or some of the innovations that are probably popular in other parts of Asia. So Japan has to actually think of this energy diplomacy 2.0 to, to leverage this competitive advantage of Asian countries and navigate together forward. I would stop here. Thank you very much uh, giving us uh, another new idea about you know, energy common and this energy policy 2.0. Okay, so I'd like to move to the Kapil-san. Could, could you uh, respond to the second and the third question? Thank you, Kentaro san uh, I, I, The first statement I'd like to make, you know, that uh, climate security concerns are going to aggressively shape country actions. And possibly I will, I will call this as a century of climate action because action now will define the, how we go ahead and, and how the energy transition shapes up. And, uh, you know, while I was impressed with uh, the the statement which uh, Nanda Kumar made on uh, that we should treat energy as a common resource, but frankly, there are uh, geopolitical considerations, and all countries uh, want to have a competitive edge on this. Uh, but going beyond that, I think there's no way out than to promote uh, multilateral cooperation. And there are several forums uh, for promoting this and, and resource diplomacy is one way forward. Uh, but I would also like to say that we need to establish transparent resource governance mechanisms. Because now if we see uh, there's a lack of trust and this trust deficit was also being clearly brought out, uh, you know, in uh, uh, the World Economic Forum, where that emerged, and, and the entire theme was on how to build trust. And this is both in between countries and within actors in the uh, energy space within the country. 
The third thing is, uh, of course, investing in research and development, uh, which Nandusa has already pointed out. And there is no way out rather to improve our uh, efficiency of uh, resources, resource extraction or energy efficiency, but also looking at uh, sustainable minerals and sorry, sustainable materials and as a replacement. And the uh, uh, last point, last but one point is to invest in infrastructure and connectivity. I think if we need to look at inter-country collaboration, uh, this investment in infrastructure, be it uh, road, highways to move material uh, from one country to another, uh, be it free trade agreements, be it uh, power transmission networks, which is so very essential to for cross-country exchange of power, uh, be it between country borders or within the country itself, I think that's extremely important. And the last is uh, you know, promoting climate diplomacy and dialogue, uh, of which again, uh, there are several forums. Uh, I just say I wanted to touch upon one point uh, on Japan's uh, uh, role. And, and I think one uh, very important model which Japan gave on critical minerals is uh, the JOGMEG stockpiling program for 34 critical minerals. And that's uh, a, a way ahead, you know, for some countries to consider. I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, giving us some sp uh, specific example of the multilateral collaboration, uh, such as transparency resource me uh, mechanism and the collaboration in the R and D, and also uh, infra infrastructure investment. So, yeah, thank you very much for giving us that insight. Then move to the Kapil san, uh, not so Kapil, uh, Jen san. Uh, could you repeat the second and the third questions? Thank you. I think many of the really uh, important points have been already made, but I may add slightly more from the U.S. perspective. I mean, this green tech um, has become really a new frontier for competition and also over the underlying minerals. And it's it's not just between China and the United States. It's also, you know, between, among U.S., China and even Europe. The European Union also has a big uh, green industrial strategy package uh, backed by uh, you know, significant funding. So um, you know, I think the, the conversation has really changed within the US and the West uh, you know, from more well, trying to deploy technologies that are good for the global climate uh, to not just deploying them, but also uh, developing them and manufacturing them at home. Uh, and stronger linkage to the, the domestic uh, industrial competitiveness and also um, you know, social uh, economic concerns such as you know um, uh, uh, you know manufacturing labor um, issues and it's really hard for Asian countries and, and all, for that matter many countries to not be affected by this you know at the individual nation levels or even obviously at the global level competitions of these, could easily really you know, create a lot of inef inefficiencies. Uh, it could slow down deployment and development of clean energy technologies. So it's really something to be really concerned about. But that said, I think you know, there's still um, space for particularly you know, um, key partner Asian countries to continue the, in, you know, the dialogues with Washington and Brussels, really highlighting some of the the values that these countries can bring to the table um, in the context of you know, expanding and diversifying the global supply chains for clean energies or, or underlining uh, critical minerals, but then also trying to really um, you know, sort of a, have more uh, global and, and regional outlook uh, in the minds of the Western policymakers. You know, some of the initial U.S. conversations uh, around the green industrial strategy was very inward looking, uh, even you know, more so than probably you know, what uh, others may find today, but very much about onshoring. Everything has to be domestic. But since then, I think there's the notion of French shoring, uh, you know, working with like-minded countries, countries that have similar political values or economic market, economic um, structures and principles uh, are you know now much more you know, seen as partners in in these endeavors, and also specifically some of the countries like Indonesia, 
you know, has rich nickel resources and really trying to actively see what sort of a win-win situation uh, they can create. Also Japan, which of course is not rich in natural resources, including minerals, but has you know, high capacity in manufacturing you know, some of the battery components, really is trying to see how they could um, help diversify the global supply chains. Um, and then quickly onto the third question that you pose, that's also a very uh, interesting, important one. I think, um, you know, I think you know, some of the speakers have already mentioned some of the specific Japanese government tools. I think Jagamex certainly is an um, uh, entity that has done um, uh, advanced Japan's resource diplomacy quite well. I think generally speaking, Japan has been um, has much more successful resource diplomacy than most other countries, including the United States, uh, maybe because of the dearth of natural resources. Uh, yet I think there is, you know, continued fine tuning that I expect uh, from um, from you know uh, countries like Japan, and also as I mentioned, some of the multilateral engagements with resource rich countries in Africa and elsewhere. Um, you know, Japan is one of the very few Asian voices in these endeavors under G7. Uh, some of the others are, you know, um, beyond G7, but I think it's very important. Uh, to continue highlighting some of the uh, regional dynamics um, Asia has in many of the multilateral initiatives uh, that you know Washington and Brussels have introduced in recent years. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jensen, for yeah pointing out some value or role of Asian countries in the supply chain of uh, critical minerals. And also, yeah, give some idea about how Japan's uh, uh, continue to fine tune their uh, resource uh, diplomacy. Yeah, thank you very much. Then I'd like to move to this final question: uh, How can international uh, cooperation effectively address the shared challenges posed by resource scarcity induced by global effort to achieve a net zero world? I think already. Uh, or the speakers or touch upon this aspect, but uh, please uh, emphasize uh, your you know kind of uh, yeah, fo fo focus highlight the how we can uh, promote international collaboration in this area. Okay, start with uh, Nandusan, please. Thank you so much. I think I will uh, uh, start with the point uh, Jane has mentioned that Japan has one of the most efficient resource diplomacy. Uh, in comparison to many other countries. I think that's definitely true. And uh, uh, to a great extent, Japan has been successful. And probably that over reliance on that success itself is the reason for worry now, because as I showed in the slide earlier, that diplomat diplomacy was shaped or that was sort of uh, tailor-made for uh, accessing fossil fuel resources, which is not the case uh, from now on. Uh, now on, the uh, uh, the most important thing, as I mentioned in the slide, are two. One is uh, technology, and the second is critical minerals. We have been discussing about critical minerals, but uh, I want to I'll, let me focus on on technology. Now, how Japan can leverage technology to influence uh, resource-rich nations. That's something which we can probably think of. One is that uh, Japan has been famous or uh, popular across the world due to its technological uh, capability. You look at actually from uh, the, the post-1945 period, Japan has actually showed a tremendous increase in terms of its technological capability. And Japan has actually reached across the world with its uh, technological uh, uh, reach. So how can Japan think of bringing back that technological progress into forefront and leverage that technological capability in supporting countries which are resource rich as well as uh, resource scarce? For example, uh, you know the, there are there are multiple ways Japan can think of supporting countries that are uh, producing a lot of uh, critical minerals. 
the kind of environmental impacts uh, that is happening in, in producing countries are extremely uh, worrying. For example, the impact on water resources, uh, impact on biodiversity, all these. So how, I mean, can Japan think of uh, supplying technologies that can reduce this footprint, that can reduce this uh, environmental impacts? I think Japan has this capacity. Probably this is something which uh, one of the ways Japan should think of uh, leveraging its uh, its technology to in its international collaboration and uh, uh, influencing basically like strengthening its own resource diplomacy. I'll stop here. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, they pointed out that the success story of Japan's fossil fuel. Uh, resource uh, diplomacy uh, do not necessarily be applied to the ne new dimension of this uh, resource di uh, diplomacy uh, currently we are uh, facing and also provide some idea about how to move forward. Yeah, thank you very much. Then uh, I would like to ask uh, Kapil-san to respond to the uh, last question. Thank you, uh, Kentaro-san. I, I really like that the way the question is framed, you've talked about shared challenges. So shared challenges imply that there's a shared responsibility and shared responsibility actually implies that there should be coordinated action. And there I would like to point out that, uh, you know, the, some of the international frameworks uh, which have been established over the past uh, two decades are really hard earned wins. And these are a good platform for international cooperation. So countries need to come together to support, for example, the three Rio conventions, which we'll see this year on biodiversity, on desertification, and on climate change. And we have to look at these conventions at, that they are clearly intrinsically linked and they are operating in the same ecosystem and address uh, interdependent issues. So a win in one needs to be uh, you know, supported by actions in another convention. The second point is that we're now seeing uh, you know, a slew of announcements and commitments and pledges in international forums. And these pledges uh, need to be implemented. And you know, we, we know that the 100 million commitment towards climate funding is, is still not met. Uh, there's been another 700 million being announced in loss and damage fund uh, for disaster risk reduction, humanitarian assistance recovery, displacement, and plan, planned relocation. And some of this uh, finance should flow in from developed countries into uh, developing countries or, or countries which do not have that many resources. And that would reflect or that would demonstrate that there is a shared responsibility of uh, countries uh, which are developed. And the third thing is that you know we need to be ambitious. Uh, the 1.5 degree C target is <clears throat> almost, uh, the window is closing down very fast. Uh, and therefore, there's a chance, uh, you know, when countries come up to renew their uh, nationally determined contributions by 2025. And uh, the call to transition away from fossil fuels is an important direction, which has been shown. But we still see, uh, you know, countries investing in LNG, in oil, in, in others, uh, fossil fuels. And uh, that does not demonstrate, uh, you know, that we are having a shared responsibility. It implies there's win for some countries, there's a loss for others. And the last point I would like to make is that uh, we, all countries uh, need to be a part of the global efforts on building cooperation. And our uh, leaders at the high level champions uh, and the climate champions team are taking some of the, these actions through our campaigns uh, by, in, by including non-state actors and, uh, and you know, looking at their engagement. And some of the campaigns, including the Race to Zero, the Race to Resilience, and uh, working along with the Marrakesh partnerships, I think that's what uh, the Breakthrough Agenda, that's what we are trying to build up, uh, international cooperation to make uh, climate ambition as, as, and, and climate technologies uh, as the favored choice by 2030. Thank you so much, Kentaro. Thank you very much for yeah, highlighting the several issues, including some activity uh, by the climate champions team. Thank you very much. 
And finally, I'd like to ask uh, Jane-san to respond to the final question. Yes, thank you. Uh, I am so glad that Ananda Kumar has brought up the technology aspect in this resource uh, diplomacy because I I do think that's uh, ever more important, particularly when we look at um, low carbon fuels like hydrogen. You know, who is you know not just manufacturing electrolyzers, but who are inventing? I think the recent patent filing trends uh, show that Japan you know used to be one of the top three countries, but recently it's still there. It's still one of the uh, the leading countries, but not really, um, but you know, there are many other countries such as China fast catching up. And I think that's you know, how uh, the Japanese government tries to um, perhaps you know, refresh some of the tools, but then also really formulate something that's much more specific, not to sort of the, the raw materials, whether it's fossil fuels or rare earth, but more of a technology segment would be very uh, key to the future success. Um, my second, just I have two um, additional comments, uh, quick ones. I think in the era of this great power competition, sometimes international collaboration or cooperation among governments becomes a lot harder to um, advance. And I think that's when different industries and private sector stakeholders really could be stepping up more. Um, one st specific context is, uh, again, sort of uh, going to hydrogen, and I think you know for hydrogen to have uh, you know in, uh, important contribution to decarbonization, I think it has to become much more uh, competitively priced. But then also you know working with pr uh, potential supplier countries like the United States, like you know Australia, and there I think many of the companies uh, are you know especially from Japan, South Korea, and, and Singapore that are likely to become import dependent for uh, hydrogen and ammonia supplies. They're already starting to cooperate and, and you know work with the companies. And I think Japan in that regard also has a role to play in really working with the having this more about intra-regional uh, collaboration within Asia, trying to really you know help expand the demand, um, uh, sort of uh, setting the, the rules of engagements uh, for the future. Uh, so that there will be a healthy, competitive, and transparent uh, market development in uh, that you know in uh, uh, in sort of trans-Pacific trade, uh, whether with the United States or Australia. And then, lastly, I think another example is the, the of the companies being important is the the first mover coalition. I think creating demand for the low low to non-carbon emitting uh, products and commodities is, you know, again, you know, not just the, the um, you know, uh, up to the governments, I think companies and consumers have to be incentivized. So, um, you know, that's another uh, area for opportunity, despite uh, the, the current sort of a, um, sort of a shift away from the era of uh, enthusiastic international cooperation to much more care for and perhaps um, apprehensive cooperation and more of a competition. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jason, and uh, thank you very much for the, all the three speakers. Uh, we got a lot of uh, insightful comment. Uh, yeah, particularly we when we discuss this uh, resource uh, diplomacy on energy security, we tend to frame this issue in terms of zero sum game, in particularly current uh, landscape of geopolitics. Uh, and also this factor or this element was all uh, highlighted by all the three speakers. But uh, all speakers move forward. Actually, they provided some opportunity or, uh, you know, uh, to move forward, you know, go beyond that uh, zero-sum game and then uh, provided some idea about uh, collaboration to move forward. So I think that really, I think we got a lot of the you know uh, rich uh, insightful idea about you know possible collaboration. Yeah, thank you very much and for your contribution. Okay, that's. Thank you, Dr. Tamara, and thank you, speakers, for your insights and perspectives on the opportunity of international cooperation. 
From now on, there will be a break. Zoom will remain open. We will resume at 3.30 Japan time. Thank you. Welcome to the thematic discussion two, mitigation of migration, food and human security, and risks mitigation. It is my pleasure to invite Dr. Nazia Hussein, Assistant Professor of the Institute for Future Initiatives, the University of Tokyo, to lead the discussion. Dr. Hussein, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Nazia Hussain. I'm an assistant professor at IFI. Um, it's my pleasure to moderate this panel. Um, the focus of our discussion today is understanding the connections between climate change and human security. The concept of human security allows us to pay attention to challenges faced at multiple levels from local communities and societies to regional and global concerns of stability. Thus, human security encompasses a host of challenges that may threaten the safety and security of individuals and groups in vulnerable communities and societies. Our speakers today will approach this framing of security and climate change through the lens of migration, food security, and risk mitigation. I will just say two briefly two points. One, that it's important here to keep in mind that power differentials exist within and among societies experiencing climate change, making some groups and communities more vulnerable than others. Number two, yet regardless of unequal burdens, climate change is eliciting responses from individuals, communities, local, national, and at the global level. So considering the interconnected nature of our world and the intricate connections among these themes, responses at any level bear consequences for the rest of the world. It's imperative then to understand causal connections among these themes. And this, as we've heard through all these presentations today earlier, is an, is, is an important task and it's a compl complicated issue, um, but one that I hope our capable speakers today may try to address. So without further ado, I would first like to invite Nagisa Shiba-san, who is a policy researcher at the Adaptation and Water Unit at IJAS. Thanks, Nazia, for your kind interaction. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm apologize for not participating in person, but I'm so glad to join the um this wonderful panel as one of the speaker. Um, my name is Nagisa Shiba. I'm a policy researcher of the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies. I'm also a member of the Human Mobility Team of the APCS project. So today I will be talking about what is climate security in the context of human mobility in the Pacific? Before getting into today's topic, please allow me to cast the fundamental questions. Why do we use climate security? This is an open question, of course, but this is something that I really want to understand throughout the project. So, Using climate security as a concept is maybe for attracting political attention to the climate action or involving security related sectors such as peacekeeping, humanitarian or military sector into climate action. Or maybe it's for understanding climate impact in more comprehensive way. So 
maybe the list goes on. So I want to keep it um, as an open questions, but I think it's really important to keep it our mind that we have to think about the um, climate change from the security perspective or vice versa, because otherwise we will end up talking nothing new or relabeling the existing issues. And the climate induced migration or climate mobility might be one of the, um, the issues that has been widely discussed over the decades. So let me go into the um, today's topic. I think um, um, when you think about climate refugee, um, which is frequently um, used in the media uh, or uh, some report, you might feel a little bit overwhelmed because um, some reports say a lot of lots of people should be displaced or re sorry relocated due to the climate change in the future. Um, in fact, a lot of report um, insists that uh, we're going to have a massive number of climate refugees in the near future. For example, the World Bank report said by 2050, more than 2 million, sorry, 20, 100 million people could move within their country due to climate change. However, we shouldn't be overwhelmed by such a, a massive estimate of the climate mobilities. I think the first step should be understanding um, what's the issue for us in terms of climate mobilities. Let me just share the scope of climate mobility. So as you know, there are a lot of different types of human mobilities. It could be, for example, voluntary or forced cross-border or internal, and also it could be temporal or permanent. So we should understand there are a wide range of different types of um, uh, climate, sorry, human mobilities. In addition to that, when we think about climate impact, there are two different types of impact. One is sudden onset events, such as typhoon, cyclone, um, uh, maybe drought, so that something happens um, uh, suddenly and it causes a lot of um, uh, human mobilities at all once. So people should be migrating as a group in many cases, and um, it should be expected that the people will return to the places of origins. On the other hand, we also consider the slow onset event, such as rebel rising. In that case, the human mobility might be a little bit different because people are migrating incrementally or gradually. So I think then the people migrate as a individual or household level or community level. So it's a little bit different from the sudden onset cases and also for example, sea level rise um, might make their place of origin inhabitable and they cannot come back to the um, home anymore. So I will say it's really difficult to distinguish sudden onset induced climate migration and the much more um, broad general migration due to natural disasters. But the slow onset event induced human mobility might be a little bit new to us. So we have to consider these kind of um, a variety of types of human mobility in the context of, of climate change. And next, why is climate mobility seen as a security threat? I will say security could be multi-layered. So it's might be the human level security issues, such as discrimination, human rights violation, failure to reintegration into the host community, or maybe conflict with host community, or maybe the cultural, physical, mental loss and damages. And it could be um, cascading into um, the different levels of security issues. 
For example, at the state level, the social or political instability, increasing humanitarian needs, mass influx of IDPs, internal displaced people, could be the uh, security concern. And also in the region, mass influx of cross-border migrants or instability of country with a lot of number of IDP might be a threat. And it ends up with the posing a lot of threat into the region as a whole. So that kind of um, um, the system of cascading and security threat could be also considered when we talk about the climate security in the context of human mobility. These days, a lot of uh, actors are now involved into the climate mobility um, because it's, attract, it tra it's attracting a lot of attention in the public. So it could include climate change actors, disaster risk reduction actors, and even migration actors. So they have different lenses, such as gender, human rights, or um, natural disaster prevention. So now we have to um, consider a lot of um, different actors joining um, the discussion on climate mobilities. Um, given this background, I think the important thing is contextualizing climate mobilities because otherwise we cannot lose focus. So today I would like to highlight the uh, Pacific Island as an example. This is just because the Pacific Island leaders talks about climate change as a security threat. I would like to draw the Boer Declaration on Regional Security, which says climate change remains the single greatest threat to the livelihood, security, and well-being of the people of the Pacific. So now climate change is a great concern for the Pacific people. So how we can contextualize climate mobility in the Pacific? First, Pacific Island country has been struggling with the institutional or social fragilities which can be um, combined with the climate impact and cause a lot of um, social unrest or instabilities. Six countries are listed by World Bank as the institutional and social fragile countries. And also, as I mentioned, sea level rising might be causing a little different types of human mobilities. And the Pacific countries is obviously affected by sea level rising, especially the low lying or atoll countries, such as Tuvalu, Kiribati, and um, Marshall Island. And another important thing is that people in the Pacific have been historically migrating within the country and cross border. For example, some countries had a special diplomatic relationship with neighboring countries. In recent, Australia and Tuvalu made a um, new agreement, which allows more than 200 people from Tuvalu can, can resettle in Australia uh, without a visa um, each year. So that could be a good example which shows the uh, special relationship with the um, between the Pacific countries and the uh, neighboring countries. I also want to introduce the Pacific Regional Framework on Climate Mobilities to show that the Pacific Island leaders are really keen to deal with climate mobility issues as their priority. So this framework was adopted back in 2023 just last year at the Pacific Island Forum held in Cook Island. And framework divide the uh, climate mobility into migration, plan relocation and displacement and raise these um, some strategies to deal with each types of climate migration. So um, this is my suggestive approach to achieve the climate security on migration, especially in the Pacific. So we know that the context is really crucial. 
for example, in the Pacific, uh, social fragility ex could exacerbate the risk of instable relocation. And the potential future influx due to sea level rise could be also considered in the longer term. At this moment, people are already migrating due to mixed reasons. For example, better education, better job, better life in general. But they might have uh, challenges in the new places. And it could be applied to the future migration. They might have the similar situation, um, whatever reason they have. And the climate change might be one of the major reasons um, in the longer term. So what we have to do is adaptation solutions or prevention of forced displacement because the forced Displ displacement is the uh, worst case scenario. So I will suggest um, three approaches. First, cross-border migration with dignity. It could be including human rights protection, legal support, or successful integration to host society, or even maintenance of cultural identities. So these kind of problem have already faced by people who migrated um, internationally, given the um, special diplomatic relations or um, any other reasons. So we have to consider um, these kind of um, uh, potential um, issues to deal with the future migration due to the climate change. And second, well-designed plan of relocation could be really important because um, um, relocation is of course the last result, but it could be highly likely happen, unfortunately. So some countries in the Pacific, for example, Fiji has developed relocation guidelines back in uh, a few years ago. Um, and the, um, this kind of planned relocation already happens to other places as well. So we have to think about how to make it smoother or more effective so that people can rebuild their life after relocation and we can um, also keep it um, sustainable and stable. So maybe we can consider water, energy, or food security for relocated community as well. And of course, we have to deal with uh, displacement risk reduction. It could be uh, related to disaster risk reduction in general. But as I said, we have to keep in mind migration should be a choice or last resort, not a necessity. So it's written in the New York Declaration on Migration and Refugee. So um, we have to think, we have to take an action to prevent a um, worst case scenario. Um, so this is a very critical step for us to um, deal with climate security in the context of human mobilities. So APCS project um, has a component on human mobility and the IGES human mobility team focuses on the um, one of the approach that I mentioned, which is a process of planned relocation we're gonna investigate the factor of stability and instability in relocated communities. We also see the role of relocation guidelines to, um, uh, to make the uh, relocation more sustainable and more stable. So we will conduct a comprehensive study on the relocation in Fiji, uh, because Fiji has experienced the relocation back in 10 years ago. So we're gonna visit the uh, Vunidogola village um, where uh, we can just um, collect uh, the information on the factors affecting the stability or instability in the relocated communities. So uh, I'm really looking forward to share with you our uh, outcomes um, moving forward. So we're gonna collaborate with the University of Fiji. Um, so yeah, let's see how uh, we can um, uh, find uh, the solution um, to the uh, sustainable uh, and more stable uh, relocations in the future. So let me summarize my presentation. So defining the issue will be the very first steps 
for uh, climate security um, in, and the human mobility. So we shouldn't be overwhelmed by the massive number of climate refugees, um, which is um, uh, sometimes alerted by media uh, or, or the scholars, uh, but we should be focusing on what's our issues. For example, for Japan, what kind of climate mobility is a threat? Maybe the um, massive number of um, cross-border migrants from the Pacific is not likely to be our um, issues at this moment. Rather than that, we have to invest more in the preventive measure adaptation solutions to um, um, to prevent the uh, forced displacement in the future. So something like that. The Pacific leaders present climate change in terms of climate um, security um, and the migration is a focus. So um, for example, um, Pacific Island countries is now uh, really critical uh, for the um, uh, neighboring countries, including Japan, um, in terms of the diplomatic and geographical um, geopolitics. Um, so we, we can think about how we can collaborate with um, the Pacific Island countries in terms of the climate security and human mo mobili mobilizations. It's really high time to think about it. In considering these kind of collaboration, the present actions should be should not be undervalued. We do not have to, um, you know, uh, end up with the uh, future discussion, but we can take um, immediate actions. For example, um, yeah, we can uh, invest in the uh, preventive um, measures um, and also the uh, support for the migrants um, who are um, migrating uh, from country to countries and the climate change could be the one of the uh, motivations, but it's not a single uh, and major um, uh, causes. So this is a kind of um, summary of my uh, presentations. So thank you very much for your kind attentions. I just want to uh, take over um, Nazia. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shiba-san. Um, thank you for defining the issue for us in all its complexity and um, directing our attention to the fact that instead of just focusing on the future, we need to look at what is happening right now. With that, may I please request Keiko Rishima-san, also at a policy researcher at IGES. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Najia-san, for the introduction. And I'm Keiko Rishima, and I'm the policy researcher at Adaptation and Water Area of IGES. And the next important issue, human security issue that I want to raise here is um, food security. And in today's presentation, uh, instead of direct delving directly into the connection between food security and climate security, I would like to begin with the premise that climate change is one of the major threat to food security. Okay, so I will start by providing an overview of the context of food security. Um, the quote listed here are definition of food security from World Food Summit and UN World Food Program, WFP. And by these two definitions, we can see that food security is a state of access to sufficient nutritious food for everyone in the world. And from this definition, uh, four aspects of food security can be identified. And you could see the four uh, contexts in the figure in the right. And the, one, the first one is food availability. And food availability is uh, sufficient quantities of food of appropriate quality. And uh, the second one is food access. Uh, this access means access by individuals to adequate resources for acquiring appropriate food. And the third one is food utilization. Uh, this means adequate diet, clean water, sanitation, and health care. And the lastly is food stability. Uh, this refers to both the avail availability and access dimensions of food security. So. The term food security has four dimensions and uh, four dimensions. 
So to ensure food uh, security, we need to look into the entire food system and consider how we can mitigate security threats for each stage. This figure is from the U European Commission and they have put forth the concept of farm to fork. And this literally means the need to look at the food system as a whole from food production uh, to sus food production in the farm to the dinner table as fork, using fork. And in this farm to fork context concept, there are four stages of the system uh, that is this identified in this figure. The first, first one is food production. And the second one is food processing and distribution. The third is food consumption. And fourth is food loss and waste prevention. So in the food system, many stakeholders are involved in each stage. And there is a lot of involvement between countries as well. So as you can see, the food system is very complex and there are multiple risks that threaten food security in all stages of food system. So to ensure food system, so there are many factors in the world that are threats to food security. Recently, the impacts of COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine has uh, have elevated food prices and this led to additional food security compared to the pre-COVID period. Also, the depo depo depopulation of rural areas in Japan has led to a decline in the agricultural production and resulting in increased dependence on imports for a significant portion of food that is consumed in Japan. And, um, and this increase in food prices directly lead to an increase of undernourished population. And according to the FAO in 2020, more than 700 million people were undernourished with half of them in the Asia Pacific region. And 460 million people in the Asia Pacific region face severe food insecurity which food uh, severe in food insecurity means that individuals have like, likely run out of food, experience hunger, and at the most extreme have gone for four days without eating. So in order to create a sustainable food system and establish food security, it is important to consider how to adapt to external factors that change the food system and how to create synergies with those external factors. This figure shows only a small portion of this external factor, but uh, the external factor increase such as rising incomes and inequality, uh, of course, climate change and decentralization, and demographical change and so on. So as I mentioned, uh, climate change is affecting the food security. So going back to the beginning of this presentation, I explained that climate change is one of the important risks for food security. And according to the IPCC report, climate change is affecting food security in different ways. Uh, such as increasing temperatures, changes in precipitation patterns, and extreme uh, events, and so on. And also the influence on agricultural production is especially evident. And in Japan, uh, for instance, uh, elevated temperatures have impacted the cultivation of rice paddies and free tree fruit trees, uh, leading to stunted growth and other issues. And another point is on small scale farmers and uh, who contribute the majority of the Asia Pacific region. They are especially vulnerable to the impact of climate change, which also creates a negative cycle of poverty. So for the food security team for this IGES climate security project, uh, 
we would like to discuss on the food security under climate change. So I would briefly like to explain about our research project. And so this is our team. Uh, so we have Dr. Naoyuki Okano from IGIS and uh, Dr. Nazia Hussain from U University of Tokyo and myself. So the three of us is, is, are in this food security team. And our shared background lies in social science research and we will focus on the non-biophysical aspect of food security. And we will particularly take the political approach. And based on our expertise, uh, we will focus on three different topics. And after uh, individual research, uh, we will try to put together all the research out outputs into one and make a uh, uh, we will present a structural framework for the intersection of food security and climate change. So the three topics that we will cover is uh, land security, water security, and international norm making of food system. So since I'm focusing on the land security, uh, I would like to explain uh, about land security and food security issues with uh, climate change. So according to IPCC report in 2019, land tenure is a key dim dimension in any discussions of land climate inter interactions and will influence the prospects for both rural adaptation and land mitigation. And also, uh, it is evident that land security plays a crucial role in agricultural production as well. So I aim to uh, research on broad and broad concept of food security by taking land as the point of view. So my research question is how is land security connected with climate security? So also I am particularly interested in land security at the local level where the producers are located. And I would like to conduct qualitative research through field work and link the local context to national, regional and international context. So uh, this picture, I took this picture when I was doing my field work in Thailand, the northern part of Thailand, and this is a uh, village located in a mountainous area of uh, Mehon Son province. And I would like to explain about land insec insecurity through this uh, case study. And the picture shown here as um, this, the whole mountain, you can see uh, the it is a uh, cornfield, and this is grown by the local people. And in this uh, cornfield, people have no formal rights to this land because this land is the preserved forest of the government under the law. And because of lack of private land, uh, the only way for the people here is to uh, farm in this uh, in this land. And they, the people there sell corn to the big food processing companies. And in order for them to sell the corns, they have to buy the seeds, fertilizers, and pesticides that is specified by the company. And in case, uh, and the prices of these are much uh, expensive than, what, than the ones that local farmers use for their uh, consumptions. And if they fail to harvest, there is no guarantee, of course. And what remains is debt. Uh, and also the corn that is harvested is ranked from A to C according to the size and prices vary accord, uh, according to the rank. And these sizes are uh, affected by, of course, climate change, like uh, the precipitation and uh, yes, and like how yeah how much rainfall they have and other kinds of uh, 
aspect. And so this community is facing land inse insecurity as well as food inse insecurity, and they are uh, vulnerable to climate change. So the politics behind these problems can be visible through field work, but the problems existing in this community has implications on national security and international security as well. So this is why I want I would like to start my research from the local level and then um, go to national and international levels. So um, my the focus is here. Uh, the focus that I will do is um, the land, it, it's called land tenure dualism. So this is a major issue in developing countries. And so as I explained in the case study, uh, farms, agricultural land of the community is actually public lands, but it is used by communities. So this uh, land tenure dualism is it, the ownership is uh, the government, but actually uh, the use like I'm the tenure. They have the community tenure to use the land to land for agriculture. So I would like to focus on this disparity of tenure rights. And this is very severe in developing countries. And according to study of World Bank, it is said that um, less than 30% 30, 30 of people have tenure rights to their land. And uh, community forests or communities agricultural lands are included in the state owned land. So the insecurity of tenure rights mean that people may lose their means of livelihood due to government policies. And these people are vulnerable not only to direct impacts of from climate change, but also to impacts from such climate change related policies that might change the use of land. So as a way forward and my conclusion, our study recognized the complexity of food security politics and uh, as I explained, there are diverse uh, aspects of food system, like uh, production, market, and processing, and also the scale analysis from like individual to international level. So uh, we think it is important to clarify the analytical framework of the study. And uh, food is integral to our lives, and simultaneously, people sustain their livelihood by uh, participating in the dynamics of the food systems. So for us, for um, people in the developed world, uh, it is also important to consider what kind of conflicts exist behind our meals and how we could uh, reduce this conflict. Ah, sorry. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. Um, thank you, Kurishima-san. Um, I will move to our last speaker, um, last but not least, especially considering that the previous two speakers have given us a relational perspective from bottom up uh, to top down. And with, you know, all these elements have political implications. So without further ado, may I please invite Akomuto-san, who is specially appointed research fellow at the JICA Research Institute for Peace and Development. Thank you very much. So at first, I really appreciate for inviting me uh, to this today's uh, very uh, exciting event. Uh, I'm, uh, my affiliation is JICA, a Japan International Cooperation Agency, Ogata Sadako Research Institute for Peace and Development. Uh, JICA, as you may know, is an implementing agency of Japan's official development assistance. So basically, I'm an aid practitioner, but uh, I've been engaged in uh, research for these several years in uh, JICA's uh, run department, which is JICA Ogata Sadako Research Institute. So, and uh, JICA Ogata Sadako Research Institute explore uh, various themes which bridges academic and practice. 
Therefore, I understand today's event also tries to bridge academic and uh, practice and also society, and which uh, I found is quite resonates to our uh, style of research. So I'm really happy to be here today. And today I'm going to explain something about uh, one of the uh, outcome of our research project, which title is Adaptive Peace Building, uh, published from the Springer Nature. And uh, well, uh, this book, unfortunately, does not deal with climate change itself. However, uh, it explores uh, the more effective or more uh, realistic or more practical uh, peace building approach. So uh, I understand then in today's invitation, uh, from today's invitation, I hope to introducing uh, the approach of adaptive peace building may be of some help to uh, advance uh, this new uh, prospective uh, launched research. Therefore, uh, today's my presentation is uh, mainly about us, mainly about uh, the adaptive uh, introduction of adaptive peace building concept and approaches. And then uh, I may raise some uh, open uh, question or something, how we can connect those uh, way of adaptive approach may uh, connected to uh, climate security or other issues related to climate change. Okay, so, uh, well, uh, the adaptive, adaptive peace building approach uh, is a kind of uh, part of a stream of peace building research that critically examines major peace building approaches developed after the Cold War, such as liberal peace building as kind of um, top down, uh, prescriptive, or kind of deterministic. And such peace building efforts may undermine society's capability to self organize its system, build resilience, or addressing perpetuating conflicts. So, uh, based on such recognition, the adaptive peace building approach provides a methodology for navigating this dilemma. And uh, it uh, suggests a process where local, national, and international peace builders, together with the societies, communities, and people affected by the conflict, actively engage in a structured collaborative process to sustain peace and resolve conflicts by employing an inducive and iterative process of learning and adaptation. So, in a word, uh, it may uh, kind of suggesting a bottom up and uh, iterative approaches based on the local community initiatives. Okay, so, uh, well, uh, the adaptive peace building uh, character concept of adaptive peace building as a multi dimensional aspect. Well, uh, in the book, uh, which I, uh, which today's presentation is based on, has uh, introducing uh, six uh, aspects of adaptive peace building. First, uh, it it should be uh, context specific, and I understand this quite resonates with the uh, presentation prior to me, uh, Dr. Kurishima and Dr. Shiba, and it's so to to be context specific. This means that uh, international cooperation should be in collaboration with uh, local actors and local community, and very should be very very sensitive to such local context. And second. To develop, uh, develop a peace to be sustainable, uh, the collaboration should be uh, goal-oriented. Practice itself is not be the objective. This is the second dimension. And the third dimension is something a simultaneous implementation to achieve a goal or to be goal-oriented. Maybe we need to conduct multiple initiatives uh, simultaneously. Not only one approach, but maybe uh, multiple uh, projects, uh, multiple uh, collaboration may be conducted simultaneously, undertaken, assessed, and adapted. And such initiative, multiple uh, initiatives, should be within in varieties. I mean, multiple initiatives are experimented with a variety of initiatives across a spectrum of probabilities, as the outcome is uncertain, even though we set a goal. So, and the fourth dimension would be a selection. 
well, uh, through uh, implementing simultaneously varieties of initiatives, maybe some uh, initiative we may, it's better to forget about it or to abandon. <laughs> or maybe uh, some, uh, so maybe some we can find a more possibility. So uh, we, we may need to abandon something, we may need to show uh, something, show more promise, which we can be further adapted through an active participatory decision making process. And the last dimension, the sixth dimension, should be iterative. Well, uh, we think that adaptive peace building is an iterative process, and all uh, such multi, uh, multi multiple initiatives or the variety of initiatives or selective one should be repeated continuously because you no know, social ecological system are highly dynamic and will continuously evolve. So, kind of. Uh, all and uh, the characteristics of adaptive uh, peace being approach shows that all those dimensions are interrelated and overlapping each other, as shown in the circles. So next slide, please. Then, um, yeah. So, based on the such kind of multi-layered concept of adaptive peace building, this slide shows uh, the considerable approaches in practices of international cooperation, peace building, and development cooperation, and others, including humanitarian, as uh, elaborated in the plenary sessions discussion. So, uh, well, uh, adapt, uh, so we, we can say that adaptive peace building approach uh, should be rooted in lo uh, local or national cultural, historical, and political understanding of peace. And then uh, it should emphasize bottom-up or homegrown approaches to achieve and sustain peace. And so such uh, context dictates ideas, priorities, values, with a focus on participatory and self-sustaining peace. And in the book, uh, we introduced uh, several case studies, uh, which found kind of uh, context-specific uh, context approaches uh, and participatory approaches. We involved the uh, case studies in Palestine, in Syria, and China's peace-building approach in South Sudan, Japan's peace-building approach in the Philippines, and also uh, case studies in the Colombia, uh, Mozambique, and Timor-Leste. Well, uh, I was engaged in this a chapter about the Syrian conflict, and it's mainly, well, it's, uh, I would say maybe it has a more context specific, but also it includes the uh, citizens' participation into the peace process. So uh, all the case study touch upon the uh, multiple dimensions of adaptive peace building. Please. And then uh, let me introduce uh, the found theoretical foundation of the approach of adaptive peace building. Uh, indeed, theory of complexity is a theoretical uh, foundation of adaptive peace building. And in the book, uh, complexity is introduced as having uh, three main characteristics. One is a holistic system. Well, uh, so the society which produced conflict may be considered as uh, in nature complex. Therefore, the holistic approach, uh, which embraces maybe even con uh, conflict or society, is quite uh, crucial. So this is the way of idea of uh, holistic. And the second characteristic is non-linearity. Well, uh, in many cases, we may easily think that uh, improvement goes step by step. However, uh, in uh, in reality, uh, social system uh, proceeds non-linear, and and it it sometimes uh, go back and forth, but uh, back and forth. Therefore, a uh, small change may happen uh, when we conduct any uh, project or any programs. So small change can have unpredictable and larger consequences. And on the other hand, it may have larger consequences. Third aspect would be a self-organization. Um, system can evolve and adapt without centralized control. And such kind of uh, theory of complexity recognize that the social or economic system move and change dynamic uh, through cycles of emergence, adaptation, and feedback. So, uh, so well, I quickly introduced uh, the concept of adaptive peace building, and it suggests uh, move from control to facilitation, and it, it uh, well taking such approach, we hope uh, we may be able to empower local actors and its process. 
and such a uh, approach em embrace diverse perspectives and encourage constructive competitions. So, and uh, it focuses on building self-organizing social institutions and networks, and it can be adaptive and responsive to changing dynamics in the local context. We can say that peace building is primarily a local process and external actor expected to facilitate self-organization and create space for local solution. So finally, uh, today I just talk, talk about, talked about an adaptive peace building, but uh, I think we can find that a big uh, overlapping or resonation between the concept of human security, which put people at the center of security. And the adaptive approach also respects the local initiative and to facilitate local approaches. So, and, and uh, my question is that how those kind of approach uh, may be in, the, in connection with the climate change issue, like uh, Dr. Kurushima mentioned. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your uh, listening. And uh, lastly, uh, this book is open access. So if you're interested in, uh, please uh, approach uh, to the website. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to all of you. Um, I have a few questions, um, but I'll ask one. And then if anyone on the floor would like to ask, please go ahead. Um, my first question to Mutashan is, um, the burdens of climate change are unequal, affecting some more than others, um, deepening inequities and sharpening all kinds of fault lines within societies and among societies. So what may be effective interventions towards reducing vulnerability and preventing such balkanization? Thank you very much for the question. Well, I would say that, as, as I mentioned, that, the, you know, uh, the, the top-down or prescriptive approach uh, may sometimes not be effective. So maybe I can reply in a very context-specific way. Uh, about it. It's, it may not be about the uh, climate change, but from the book, I can say that uh, the case studies indeed takes uh, quite different approaches. For example, in the book, uh, there is a Colombian, uh, case, Colombian conflict case study, and there 11 armed groups engaged in peace process respectively with the government. And the regional uh, peace agreement were uh, accumulated to the overall entire uh, peace agreement. And in, in another case, uh, in the case of the conflict in the Fili Mindanao Philippines, a uh, very limited country, let's say Japan and Malaysia, were, invo were involved in supporting uh, the peace negotiation between the Philippine government and the opposition group. The very limited country made mediation. So those, we can say that those two approaches are quite different. So, uh, and, uh, and it, it means that the, uh, the uh, conflict affected people's situations are different, as you mentioned correctly. But also, so in this case, uh, the resolution or uh, the pathway to the resolution should be also different. So, and uh, there might be no panacea for all, all affected cases. Therefore, I, I understand that we should be very, very sensitive and we should be very, very uh, welcoming the local initiative and local idea and to facilitate people's uh, intention toward peace or in, uh, res uh, to resolving climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, so my question to uh, Kurushima-san and Shiba-san would be, considering the enormous scale of challenges facing communities and governments around the world, what can be done to increase partnerships among key stakeholders at any level, community, local government, regional, and so forth? And what are the obstacles in fostering such partnerships? Uh, so should I remind you? <laughs> So I will begin. Um, since I think the keyword for um this session might be local, um, I want to emphasize the role of local government in the local level um human, uh, security, and so I believe that the local government is like uh taking the role in bridging the national government and the local communities, and um. I used to work with an NGO in Thailand on community development and to support community-based uh, forest management in Thailand. And so I I worked in like more than 20 villages, but um, I think uh, overall the successful community-based forest management, the, the local government uh, understand uh, the importance of 
community-based uh, forest management and uh, the unsuc unsuccessful community-based uh, forest management or the villages that don't have this um, management system is the villages that local government is not supportive of. So um, I believe uh, in that sense, uh, it is important for the local government to translate like national policies or uh, more, of course, like international policies, like um, context. I think community-based uh, forest management is more in the international society discussion. So I think translating those into local communities is very important. And for the obstacles, um, I think so the translating these um, international concepts or uh, the national policies needs like capacity development of the local government. I think they need the understandings of this uh, concept and policies. So there like the NGOs or like international organization have the role for this uh, capacity development. And I think um, it is important uh, for us, like for the research institutions as well. Thank you, Kurishima-san. And now, Shiba-san. Um, thank you very much. It's an interesting question. Um, you know, um, the climate mobility is not covered by the refugee convention. So technically speaking, climate refugee doesn't exist. But it doesn't mean we cannot take any actions um, for that. So gathering the knowledge and experience of the um, of the communities or countries will be the key. So I think the um, international partnership is now growing up. For example, the Global Center for Climate Mobility was set up back in a few years ago. Uh, so that kind of um, partnership is uh, really um, playing a, a crucial role in widening the um, partnership that can share the experience and knowledge. Um, but the obstacle is also um, obvious. So, um, for example, um, the kind of a migration is sometimes supported by the bilateral relationship, but uh, it could be sometimes it could be too much um, politicized. For example, in the Pacific regions, um, some countries um, made an uh, agreement on the migration. Um, given the situation um, that the, the, the China is increasing its presence and there are a lot of um, you know, diplomatic um, uh, conflict between China and Taiwan and the traditional uh, donors are trying to, um, you know, uh, supporting the uh, countries. But if we politicize the, um, the issues too much, someone will be left behind. So I think that kind of obstacle should be um, considered when we think about the, um, when we think about how can international community deal with the human mobility and climate change issue. Thank you. These are very thought provoking um, answers and we are two minutes shy of finishing the session, but if anyone has a question, please go ahead. Um, sure, Akana-san. Right, thank you. Thank you for the wonderful panel. I learned a lot. Have a question to Muto-san. Thank you for joining us again. And our, uh, your talk actually reminds me of the one report, that, which is a uh, new climate for peace, uh, published a couple of years ago in as a G7 initiative. And I think I understand that Delphi contributed strongly to that. And where this is just an integrated approach, we try to push forward that in order to uh, respond to the climate security challenge, we need to uh, put together climate change adaptation, development, and peace building. So essentially, we can't really solve the climate security through the environmental policy, but rather we should more integrate the development of peace building and mainstream climate change in those approaches. So to think about it, your presentation about adaptive peace building was quite sort of voting for me. So my sorry for the long background, but my question would be the how um the in a peace building community, how this kind of transition, if I understand correctly, from the more like traditional way of peace building to the adaptive, more interactive approach of peace building. And if if 
you think about the to integrate the climate change aspects also into the peace building, for example, a long term prediction and how do we incorporate such idea to the peace building approach, or what kind of uncertainties and risks should be also considered as part of peace building. So based upon your experience in the peace building, uh, what can be the challenges and what can be the way forward to integrate climate change into the peace building practice? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting question. Well, uh, in my understanding, adaptive peace building is a kind of, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's a kind of a critical uh, examination to the uh, kind of traditional peace building. But it, it does not mean that traditional peace building is always prescriptive, uh, prescriptive or uh, uh, top down or imposing something. It, Peace builder, I think, understand it. They always try to be uh, adaptive and lo and localized. But but unfortunately, uh, some conflict may not uh, in such situation. Therefore, adaptive peace building is a kind of um, United Nations uh, one of the one of the challenge uh, approach to to support United Nations agenda uh, to shift uh, the peace building more localized and more uh, adaptive to the context. So it's kind of um, kind of a uh, new new uh, not not new way of thinking but new initiative to 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 shift um shift more on a practical level and uh, and also from uh 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 uh, let's say, well, even if, even though it's uh, kind of having back and forth, but basically it has uh, before the conflict and during the conflict and after the conflict. And during the conflict, it may sometimes quite take a long time, let's say uh, 10 years or 20 years or something like that. So when the conflict is intensified, maybe people may not be able to consider much about the climate change because they are in a conflict. However, I think we can cooperate in preventive Prevention in the prevention stage. I mean, before the conflict, I think uh, international cooperation can do a lot. And also, when uh, we can uh, reach a peace peace agreement or a ceasefire agreement, I think we can incorporate uh, climate change aspect from the long term perspective. And because such kind of long term perspective is quite important for the development cooperation aspect, in addition to the emergent humanitarian assistance. So I think. We're looking at the conflict phase, we can uh, find the uh, meeting point of mainstreaming climate change. I'm sorry, I'm over, uh, I'm exceeding time. Thank you so much. Thank you for these wonderful presentations um, and answers. And uh, thank you to all of you for listening to us. And with this, I conclude this panel. Thank you for sharing your experience and insights. Thank you, Dr. Hussein. From now on, there will be another break. Soon we remain open. We will resume at 4.40 Japan time. Now we resume the symposium. The next agenda item is thematic discussion three, ocean policy and maritime governance. I am pleased to invite Dr. Miko Mayakawa, Senior Research Fellow of the Ocean Policy Research Institute, Sasakawa Peace Foundation, who will moderate the discussion. Dr. Mayakawa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to you all and greetings to um, all of you who are online. Thank you very much for your participation. As mentioned, this session will focus on ocean policy and maritime governance. The ocean connects us all. In fact, the ocean covers two thirds of the planet. The ocean hosts vast biodiversity and modulates the global climate system by regulating cycles of heat, water and elements, including carbon. Ocean and coastal ecosystems support life on Earth and many aspects of human well-being. For instance, 
around 90% of traded goods are carried by ocean shipping. Increasingly, there are more competitions over the use of this common space and within the areas of national jurisdiction for shipping, fishing, natural resource exploration, and so on. At the same time, the ocean is being impacted by climate change and promoting uh, and prompting some new arrangements for use, for its use and conservation activities. Presently, about 40% of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of the coast and coastal areas are at the front line of increasing risks caused by climate change, including sea level rise, coastal flooding in low-lying areas, coastal erosion, and so on. Having said this, I believe that ocean and maritime sectors can also provide solutions for climate change mitigation, adaptation, and cooperation among countries for enhancing security. So now it is my pleasure to invite three distinguished speakers to provide us with their insights on this important topic. The first speaker is um, Rear Admiral Kazumine Akimoto. Uh, Mr. Akimoto began his career in 1967 when he joined the Japan Maritime Self Defense Force, JMSDF. He then was assigned as a senior researcher at the National Institute for Defense Studies in 1995, and later he joined the Ocean Policy Research Institute of the Sasaka Peace Foundation where he currently serves as Senior Research Fellow. Uh, Mr. Akimoto, you have the floor, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Maikawa, and uh, also the uh, thank you, uh, IGS uh, members, uh, to invite me. And uh, the, uh, today, uh, let me make a, a brief uh, presentation uh, titled uh, Warming Arctic Ocean Implication for Asia Pacific Geopolitics. At the beginning, uh, first I uh, titled, my title was the uh, Warming Arctic Ocean Implication for Indo-Pacific. <laughs> uh, Professor the, uh, Atokuchi mentioned, and, but uh, I changed the title for Asia Pacific Geopolitics. Uh, could you please move on? Could you, may I ask you to, oh, yes. Before, before, yeah. Okay, thank you, and uh, I uh, prepare a manuscript with 10 minutes, only two minutes. So uh, let me uh, read out the paradigm. The security environment of the Asia Pacific region will be uh, bound to change dramatically as the melting Arctic sea ice uh, progresses. Next slide, please. As the melting ice phenomenon in Arctic Ocean is accelerated, the Arctic Ocean becomes a new maritime corridor connect the world oceans. By using the Arctic Sea Route, all of the major world sea lanes are uninterruptedly connected, and the vessel could circumnavigate the seas around the Euro-Africa continent and the American continent endlessly, like a Mabius loop. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, for example, uh, one vessel which departs some East Asian seaport could travel around the Euro Arctic continent endlessly, then the same vessel could circumnavigate continuously around the American continent like a numeric eight shaped circle. Appearing such an uninterrupted sea circle could surely make paradigm shift to classical geopolitics. Next slide. In classical geopolitics, Alfred J. Mackinder revealed the uh, 
geographical confrontation between land power and sea power as pivotal area heartland and the outer edge crescent. Later, Nicholas Speakman referred to uh, crescent uh, named uh, Halford J. Mackinda as Rimland. The classical geopolitics were uh, presented in an age when the Arctic Ocean was closed by ice and impossible to access. The uninterrupted sea circle brought by melting of Arctic sea ice could uh, completely overturn the classical geopolitics. At the Russo Japanese War, the Russian Empire's Baltic fleet departed to Latvia in October. 1904, prepare for the battle with the Imperial Japanese Navy. The main force of the Baltic fleet had no choice but to pass around the Cape of Good Hope, south of Africa. After the long voyage, they arrived at the Sea of Japan in May 1905. The deployment took about seven months and eventually destroyed by Imperial Japanese Navy. If the Arctic Sea route was opened at that time, the battle may have presented different situation. Uh, Japan advocates the vision free and open in the Pacific, considering the world Surely, environment under the uh, free and open Indo Pacific vision, uh, geographical, geopolitical pivot, namely New Heartland, may be able to image in the Asia Pacific region for uh, Japan. If we realize New Heartland in the Asia Pacific region, we must image New Limland on the Arctic Maritime Corridor illustrated at the screen. If the Arctic Ocean is well secured, the Arctic Maritime Corridor brings prosperous and well-shaped governance to the Asia Pacific. But if the Arctic Ocean is a theater of the major power conflict, the connectography for further deployment, development is no longer impossible. Rather, the Arctic Ocean will become a corridor to bring another new security threat into the Asia Pacific. As for the security environment of the Asia uh, Arctic Ocean, we see the impact of the, uh, the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Military activities are increasing in surrounding the Arctic Ocean, uh, which cause apprehension of accidental arms conflict. Finland has joined NATO and Sweden set to join NATO. Uh, there is a pre presentiment of the Second Cold War or breaking armed conflict. Adding to the historical uh, dispute over territories and boundary delimitation, the security environment of the Arctic Maritime Corridor is fluidizing. Uh, for ensuring the safety security environment around the Arctic Ocean, we should call for the importance of the uh, safe, safety of navigation and uh, stabilized security environment over the Arctic Maritime Corridor as a, the world common interest. Uh, regarding the security in the Arctic, June 7 in 2023, uh, last year, former United States Chief of Naval Operation Admiral Gildy called for a massive international exercise in the Arctic, similar to the Arim uh, Pacific exercise, uh, saying that the uh, trade route between Asia and Europe will fundamentally change in our lifeline due to the erosion of the polar ice cap. The Arctic becomes now an area of competition that we must think more deeply about. In recent years, trans-regional joint defense exercise and operations 
have been intensifying between Europe and the Asia Pacific. For example, in nine, uh, 2023, uh, last year, Japan participated in the NATO member state joint exercise air defender in German. And uh, France, United States, and Japan conducted coordinated air sea drill in the East China Sea. Uh, Canada, France, Japan, and the United States carried out naval drill in the East China Sea. At to the NATO or Japan regular meeting, uh, individu uh, individually tailored partnership program was adopted, uh, which includes security cooperation uh, with uh, NATO and uh, Japan. Besides, NATO and the nations in the Indo-Pacific are planning to develop a new cooperation plan and the liaison office in Tokyo. As for the liaison office in Tokyo was uh, opposed by France last year, and uh, it is not sure whether it was rejected or still on the table. And uh, the stage of the current security interactions between Europe and Asia Pacific, uh, mainly on the Atlantic and uh, Indian Oceans. Next slide. Uh, in view of the accelerating global warming phenomenon and melting Arctic sea ice, security cooperation between Europe and the Asia Pacific through the Arctic Maritime Corridor may become increasingly important. That is all my pre today's presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Akimoto-san, for your very comprehensive um, presentation highlighting the issues relating to um, the Arctic Ocean. Thank you very much. Now I have the pleasure of inviting our next speaker, Mr. Gabriel Dominguez, Asia editor, defense correspondent at the Japan Times newspaper. Uh, he worked for uh, Deutsche Welle, Germany's uh, international broadcaster, as their Asia Pacific editor, followed by moving to London to work for the Jane's Defense Weekly publication. And two years ago, Gabriel started working in Tokyo, joining the Japan Times. You have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Can you hear me? Okay, excellent. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank you for having me here today at this very important conference on climate security. Uh, as already mentioned, I'm Gabriel Dominguez. Uh, I am the defense and geopolitical correspondent at the Japan Times newspaper. Today, I'd like to share with you some of my findings on the important question of how climate change is expected to not only influence geopolitical tensions, but also impact militaries across the Asia Pacific region, in particular with the Japan's uh, self-defense forces. My findings are based on research and discussions with subject matter experts, as well as former and current military personnel. Uh, to start off, let me provide you with a quick overview of the topics I would like to briefly uh, address. Uh, these include the, the security implications of climate change and what is already a worsening international security environment in Asia. How this affects Japan and the SDF in particular, and the factors used to measure the future impact on both Japanese and U.S. military bases and equipment. Last but not least, I'll briefly mention uh, the measures that Tokyo has pledged to uh, tackle the issue and also indicate what more could and should be done about this issue. So what's at stake? I think one of the main conclusions from my research is that climate change is not only impacting weather events, but also affecting the global geopolitical landscape, where it can not only aggravate existing security issues, but at worst also give rise to new and unpredictable threats. As sea levels continue to rise, small islands in the Pacific and Indian Oceans could see much of their territory become uninhabitable over the coming decades. But it's not just them. Coastal megacities in China, as well as in South and Southeast Asia, are already at risk. While not all Asia-Pacific countries will be affected to the same extent, 
the region is both highly exposed and highly vulnerable to climate hazards, especially droughts, floods, extreme heat, and typhoons. The rate and severity of these weather events is expected to slow economic growth, affect military activities and infrastructure, while possibly leading to a breakdown in critical services in some countries. This could undermine the stability of politically and economically vulnerable nations in Asia. As for maritime security, rising sea levels will affect disputed low-lying maritime features. It also means that warming oceans could shift fish distribution. Moreover, transboundary water management will become more fraught, as countries would be less willing to share a key resource like water in times of drought. I think former Maldivian Defense Minister uh, Maria Didi said it best when she warned that as the world enters never-before-seen climate projections, conflicts are likely to become, quote-unquote, more frequent, more widespread, and far bloodier. The Pentagon has also sounded the alarm, calling climate change a critical national security threat long before Japan made a similar declaration. So how does this affect Japan's self-defense forces? Let's not forget that the self-defense forces are set to become the third best-funded military uh, by 2027, should the government implement those plans it announced in late 2022. So Japan is expected to see a growing number of extreme weather events over the coming years, including storm surges and scorching temperatures. According to the Japan Meteorological Agency, the country will experience more severe typhoons and as much as 1.5 times more rainfall, thus increasing the risk of flooding. But this will not only endanger civilians, but also military sites, personnel, and gear, thereby putting Tokyo at greater risk of geopolitical shocks. More specifically, extreme weather events will threaten the self-defense forces' plans and operations including the use of assets such as helicopters, planes, and ships, while also affecting the performance of communication systems and remote sensing capabilities. Why is this important? Well, because if bases and installations of critical equipment, uh, sorry, because if bases, uh, installations, or critical equipment were to suffer severe damage from either extreme heat, recurrent, recurrent flooding, and or storm surges, then the STF and US forces would be unable or at least limited in their capability to carry out effective military operations in a potential conflict, either in the South China Sea or the Western Pacific. Another consequence of extreme weather events is that they will also increase demand for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations. This means that the STF would be asked to deploy more frequently across Japan and the region in response to floods, landslides, storms, and other natural disasters. While it's great to have a force that can help out in case of natural disasters, the main issue with this is that the more the SDF is required to do so, the greater the toll this will take on personnel and resources that would otherwise be needed for national defense. A drop in operational readiness could impact Japan's deterrent strategy, as well as its new, more proactive defense posture at a time when the country is grappling with an already rapidly deteriorating security environment. Just imagine a scenario where you would combine typhoons with torrential rains, and then something unexpected, not climate change related, could strike, say, an earthquake. The number of SDF forces required to help out would be very large. But why would, what if this happened during a conflict? It's also important to point out that uh, the effects of climate change would not be limited to infrastructure or equipment. Frequent flooding, landslides, or wildfires could also impact training. For instance, the number of training days could be reduced due to damaged facilities or disrupted access to them while also making disaster relief deployments longer and more complex. There could also be logistical problems due to disruptions to the transportation network, 
or even issues with power and water supply at military bases, which would render them largely ineffective. And last but not least, the SDF and U.S. personnel could face increased health risks due to extremely high temperatures. Just how much each military facility in Japan would be affected by climate change over the coming decades, it's unclear or a closely guarded secret. The defense ministry has repeatedly told me that it is not yet, yet possible to determine this with certainty. The issue is that the impact will depend on several factors, including a facility's location, sea level rise, the frequency and intensity of these extreme weather events, and a facility's capacity to bolster its resilience against such extreme weather. What is publicly known, though, is that sea levels along the Japanese coastline have been rising since the 1980s and are predicted to increase by up to one meter by the end of this century. This suggests that military facilities near the ocean, including those at Sasebo in Nagasaki Prefecture, Yokosuka in Kanagawa Prefecture, and particularly those in Okinawa Prefecture, will be at even greater risk from storm surges, flooding, and coastal erosion. Severe damage to these facilities, particularly those in Okinawa, could hamper SDF capabilities in the country's southwestern islands, which would play a key strategic role in any Taiwan contingency. So how is Tokyo handling the issue? Well, until not too long ago, there was limited public talk about climate security within Japan's defense circles. However, this changed officially in May 2021 when the Ministry of Defense unveiled a climate change task force, signaling Tokyo's acknowledgement of the issue's severity. This was followed two months later by Japan's uh, defense white paper, which uh, for the first time formally described climate change as a security issue facing the country. An important factor behind this move was Tokyo's commitment in October 2020 to become a natural, uh, a carbon neutral economy by 2050. The strategy sets an emissions reduction target for the Defense Ministry and the SDF of 50% by fiscal year 2030 compared to fiscal year 2013, although this excludes emissions produced by defense equipment. But arguably, one of the biggest steps forward was the ministry's launch in August 2022 of its first response strategy on climate change. The strategy places a heavy emphasis on innovation and Japanese energy development. For instance, it mentions the intended use of hydrogen and ammonia and sets a target to quote unquote, research, develop, manufacture, and procure alternative fuels in Japan. The strategy also prioritizes capacity building and expertise sharing with South Asian and Pacific Island countries. The aim is to reduce demand for disaster relief operations overseas. It also envisions using reservists, retired SDF personnel, volunteers, and private companies in domestic disaster responses so as to not overburden the SDF. Another important step was taken in Japan's latest uh, National Defense Strategy Review. Um, in it, Tokyo pledged to improve the sustainability and resilience of the country's defense facilities within a 10-year period. For instance, the government said it plans to construct underground command headquarters, as well as to relocate and consolidate facilities in major bases and camps. This will be done according to their strategic importance. More broadly, though, what Tokyo is aiming to do is to systematically draft a roadmap to strengthen all of the country's military facilities and make them more energy independent, among other things, by using renewables. So what more can be done? Well, I think one of the major challenges is to first and foremost to ensure that these plans are sufficiently funded and don't fall victim to possible budget cuts due to polit political infighting in the future. Um, let's remember that climate change is happening regardless of political considerations. This is important as the transition will be complex and require uh, a range of updates to equipment, installations, 
including building infrastructure for renewable energies and developing new sources of fuel to power military assets. After all, you don't want uh, um, anything going off, a bomb or munition, because it got too hot. So these are all aspects you need to take into consideration. I'd like to end with an observation. Um, the SDF is being pulled in several directions at once at the moment, making the energy transition, improving resilience, increasing disaster relief missions, all the while trying to upgrade its overall capabilities and prepare for potential contingencies. And as the impact of climate change increases, this may threaten to push the STF to the limit, which is why the next few years will be key in determining the success of the government's approach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabriel, um, for walking us through the key issues relating to climate security for Japan. Now, it's my pleasure to invite our third speaker, Ambassador Dr. Fabrizio Bozzato, Senior Research Fellow at the Ocean Policy Research Institute of the Sasaka Peace Foundation. Dr. Bozzato is a political analyst focusing on Indo-Pacific dynamics. He has published and lectured extensively on a range of themes from blue economy policies in insular Pacific to cross-strait security problematics. He serves as ambassador of the Sovereign Order of Malta to the Republic of Nauru. Uh, Fabrizio-san, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Dr. Maikawa. Greetings from Venice, Italy. I'm sorry I cannot be uh, with you in person today. Uh, as I said, today I have the honor of addressing you both in my Sasakawa Peace Foundation and diplomatic capacity. This is the structure of my presentation. Uh, I will state the problem, then I will introduce uh, the Pacific Islands region, elaborate on uh, uh, climate security and climate security discourse in the region, uh, focus and delve on uh, the relationship between cl regional climate security and Pacific Island ecopoetics and ecopolitics, and offer some conclusions. Uh, but for for the sake of doing that, I will uh, select some of um, the slides of my presentation. You have the, the full presentation anyway. The problem, the problem is that. Uh, by virtue of the shared national geographic characteristic, Pacific Island nations have an overlapping set of shared vulnerabilities to the environmental societal impacts of climate change. And moreover, for the Pacific, climate change is not an hypothetical. It is real and is happening now. So welcome to the Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific, as you say, Blue Pacific. I think that my friends in the Pacific Islands region will prefer the expression Pacific Asia. Uh, the region is conventionally divided in three ethnogeographic uh, subregions: Micronesia, Melanesia, Polynesia is home to 12 million people. It has a very complex uh, political geography being inclusive of uh, uh, states, uh, freely associated states and territories. But what groups together uh, all those states and, and, and dependencies is a, a large ocean awareness or a new maritime awareness uh, meaning that uh, the uh, nations and the territories in the region are repositioning themselves as large ocean states rather than small island states. Uh, but in fact, by virtue of the exclusive economic zones, they control uh, significant marine resources like tuna fisheries or the seabed minerals that are, are coming to the, force, um, to the fore more and more in these days. This map shows you how extensive their econo economic, exclusive economic zones are. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, their relations with the extra regional world are marked by asymmetry to their disadvantage. Uh, one way to transcend this asymmetry is uh, 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 using uh, or, or operating through process of localization, which the local and the, lo uh, and the local uh, are in a synergy and the islands are not just globalization impacted, but they also globalization shapers. For example, uh, they are invested by uh, global communication 
uh, uh, and media fluxes, but and they're also able to use them at the same time to voice their climate security concerns. Now there is a this uh, this alignment or a well a bifurcation between the regional security concerns of the traditional or uh, long-standing partners of the region, mainly uh, Western Allied powers that uh, concede the uh, regional security priorities in terms of the strategic importance of the Pacific Islands and the regional security concerns of the Pacific Island nations. There are the revolt around climate security. As Dr. Patrick Scherder said in 2022, the strategic competition is blind, blinding countries from the threat of climate change in the Pacific. Fortunately, we have a document that clearly spells out the uh, regional security and climate security priority of the Pacific Islands, which is the uh, Boy Declaration of Regional Security, uh, stating that climate change remains the single greatest threat to the livelihood, security, and well-being of the peoples of the Pacific. Uh, we can identify six compound climate fragility uh, clusters in the, in, in the, the region. Uh, I uh, list them. Climate change induced displacement and migration, impacts on ocean economy, impacts on health, food and water security, natural disaster recurrence and coping capacity, impacts of sea level rise on maritime zones and boundaries, penetration of transnational organized crime and terrorism. Some of them were already elaborated upon uh, in, by uh, my distinguished uh, fellow presenters. We can see the Pacific Islands uh, by virtue of the uh, prioritization of uh, uh, climate change uh, concerns as a climate change regional security complex. And as such, uh, they uh, cooperate intra-regionally for the sake of mitigation and adaptation. And across the region, there is understanding that uh, tackling climate change is going to be a transgenerational endeavor. Uh, as for the climate security discourse in the Pacific Islands, it unfolds along three vectors, uh, politics, diplomacy, science, academia, civil society, and eco-poetics, all amplified or voiced through the media regionally and globally. Uh, when it comes to politics and diplomacy, we should keep in mind that Pacific diplomacy is often characterized by the Pacific way of consensus diplomacy. Uh, and that uh, consensual way uh, enables the Pacific Island nations to assess a common identity based on shared challenges and also to own and shape the regional security agenda for the sake of voicing the will and, 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 the, and, the, and the instances of the Pacific peoples. Now, I would like to narrow the focus on a component of the third vector, ecopoetics, uh, I'm, I assure you, I'm not going postmodernist. It has very tangible and consequential geopolitical implications. Ecopoetics is uh, means poetically, spiritually, holistically describing and addressing ecological uh, processes, crises, and transformations. It can be poetry, music, journalism, uh, and uh, in essence, on the one hand. Uh, is about spiritual and societal resilience in the face of the environmental crisis through Pacific Island identity and solidarity. On the other hand, uh, is a way to uh, being heard by the global community and recognized as a climate change environmental security frontline. And also additionally, is a way to fulfill the spiritual mandate as custodians of the Pacific or the ocean. Then we cannot, consider ecopoetics eco uh, uh, separately from ecopolitics, which is a form of uh, ecopoetics in itself. And here comes the uh, uh, geopolitical uh, and security implications. Uh, 
the eco-poetics, eco-politics dimension is important for designing alliances, conducting climate diplomacy and policies toward and with the Pacific Island nations. In other uh, terms, uh, if uh, partners of the region are able to attune to the eco-poetic or eco-political discourse of the Pacific Island nations, they, they can uh, affect some geopolitical alignment that uh, can be characterized as a climate security alliance or can bring to a, a, a climate security alliance and give those partners of the region a geopolitical competitive advantage. Ecopolitics and politics didn't start with climate change in the region, but with decades of nuclear testing and uh, predatory phosphate mining. So, and these are my conclusions. Climate ideas in the Pacific Islands, especially in the Pacific Islands, frame interests and create coalitions. And share ideas create an ideational process of interactions among states where the mutual decisions are driven by those ideas. In particular, a concept, a vision, a platform that arises from the uh, imperative of uh, uh, fronting the climate crisis and tackling climate change is that of the Blue Pacific, which is an holistic and uh, both an holistic and a strategic approach. Uh, and basically, it is about building a sustainable Pacific society through green, blue Pacific economies. This is a daunting challenge that the Pacific Island nations cannot face alone, shouldn't face alone. So the uh, well-intended, effective, long-standing commitment of regional parties like Japan is needed. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Fabrizio-san, for your very insightful presentation and providing a perspective from the Pacific region. Uh, now we have about 10 minutes left for discussion. So um, I would like to invite uh, comments, questions um, from the participants um, here. And um, while you um, think, perhaps I can raise a few uh, questions um, to, to the panelists. Um, one, one question I have to you, Gabriel, is um, do you think that um, climate change ever be tackled without the great powers operating? Um, it's difficult. The great powers are also the greatest polluters. So um, I think um, global problems require global solutions. And if they don't cooperate, it's going to be very hard to, to get there, uh, especially as the world gradually starts forming blocks. I think um, one of the important things that we need to keep in mind is that climate change right now is taking uh, place at a time of an intensifying geopolitical competition. And those things cannot be set apart. Um, and um, especially the competition over energy and resources, uh, while this is key for creating uh, a healthier environment overall, it's also key for natural sec national security. And so this will give uh, whichever power, whichever major power, uh, is most developed an edge in in these key areas, whether it's in the military area, in the industrial area, or in the technological area. So it's going to be very difficult to see um, major powers like the United States and China cooperating fully on any of these sectors anytime soon, as they are all somehow related also to national security. There will be, of course, some level of cooperation, possibly at the very global international level, but I probably don't see that as at least at least as intensely as it should be anytime soon. Um, and the unfortunate side of that is that um, 
the poor countries are going to be the ones bearing the brunt of the uh, consequences. Well, thank you very much. Um, I guess um, uh, it's important to seek um, corporations at multiple levels. Um, now, I would like to raise a question to Fabrizio San, uh, working in the region. When um, looking at the Pacific region, you highlighted the common standpoint, you know, coming from the region very strongly. Um, could you please give us some examples um, on the um, on the ground activities, you know, coalitions on the ground that you you see, and um, how do the countries in the region overcome the you know differences um, in opinions to come up with um, you know common standpoint? Uh, the region itself is a quite you know diverse um, you know um, culture, and um, back, it has you know diverse culture and backgrounds and so on. So I have. Uh, I would like to raise these two questions, you know, activities on the ground and how to overcome, you know, differences. Well, I think you have to unmute yourself, please. Thank you for a very important question. And uh, with your permission, I would like to uh, start with the second part of the question. Yes, as you uh, point out, the region is quite diverse. Uh, to a certain extent, it lacks cohesiveness, but the consensus on the prior prioritization of climate change is one of the pillars uh, of regional uh, cohesiveness, unity, and identity. So uh, the Pacific Island nations disagree on many issues. Uh, they, there are controversies in the re region. There are uh, uh, factions. There are gro uh, geopolitical groupings. But when it comes to climate change, they are still able to project a more or less united front to create and to send a united message. So when they, uh, the, the, the Pacific Island Forum leaders come together early to discuss regional matters, one thing they can certainly agree upon, of course, with differences from the, the leaders from Australia and New Zealand, which are part of the Pacific Island Forum, uh, but they all agree on climate change, its urgency and the need for measures. And now, when it comes to uh, activities on the ground, uh, I would like to emphasize that the dimension of globalization is important. So there are many grand plans for the region, but the activities that actually are making the difference are those conducted are the very national or even sub-national village level. Uh, I will, I can uh, mention uh, one policy by Australia, which is uh, regional, but also as uh, positive elements of uh, locality, which is the Vuvale policy. Vuvale in Fijians means family, for example. And there are also initiatives at uh, a local level conduct, for example, that by the Nippon Foundation, the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. I'd like to mention our colleague, uh, Shiozawa-san. Uh, so every major power that is a partner of the Pacific has policies, as programs, as projects, uh, they all work more or less, but not all are well received by the uh, Pacific Islanders to the same extent. I will say that the European Union and Japan are virtuous examples. And I stop here. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um... 
I would like to also raise a question, um, sort of um, bringing back um, the discussion to sort of the uh, global um, perspective. Um, may I ask how um, geopolitics are related to climate change um, in the ocean sphere? If you could recap that, that would be helpful. Uh, thank you. That's a very uh, important uh, point, I think. The, uh, <clears throat> Uh, for today's my presentation about to my uh, today's uh, presentation, some idea I may argue that it's not a issue or agenda uh, related to climate security, but a matter of uh, traditional geopolitical competition. But uh, <clears throat> As uh, when it comes to the definition of the uh, climate security, uh, we see uh, several ideas. Uh, someone is uh, very narrow sense, and another one is a uh, broad sense. And uh, today I uh, took my presentation as a broadest. Uh, uh, a sense of climate security. And uh, uh, as for impact of warming Arctic phenomena, uh, uh, current uh, subject to discussion uh, mainly on issues due to uh, environmental or ecosystem uh, disruption or uh, such as civil rights, uh, migration, or fishing dispute or so. But I think the, uh, these unsafety uh, security environment uh, could easily uh, bring the uh, arms conflict. And uh, I think uh, it is not too much to say that uh, uh, many of uh, wars and uh, armed conflict uh, in human history were uh, caused by the geopolitical, uh, changing geopolitical condition uh, was uh, originated by uh, climate change. Uh, Big disaster, large disaster, or migration, uh, big migration, or so forth. So the uh, uh, the uh, this is uh, uh, the uh, I would like to uh, uh, explain the how the uh, climate uh, change impact on the geopolitics, and so I took my presentation today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we can explore further uh, within the joint research as well. Um, if you have any questions, Dr. Sensei, please. Oh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Maikawa. And also, uh, you know, uh, I'd like to thank all the three uh, great presentations. Thank you very much. Um, one of the you know security issues which have not been discussed yet today in relation to climate change is arms control issue. I'm asking this question because there are so many ideas and uh, programs and uh, projects about you know, geoengineering in relation to you know, uh, climate, uh, climate change. And uh, you know, I'm asking this question because you know, in the past, there, was some, there were some you know, in, uh, you know, examples of using uh, uh, technologies to try to change climate. For example, in the Vietnam War era, the United States conducted you know, Operation Popeye uh, in order to cause you know, artificial rain, uh, in order to prevent the Viet, uh, Viet Cong fighters from using the Ho Chi Minh route. And also, you know, it's a an hostile use of technology. And uh, also, you know, uh, there was a news, a news report that China, uh, Used a similar technology uh, just in front uh, uh, in advance of the uh, Beijing uh, Winter Olympic Games uh, in order to you know cause you know artificial snow. So uh, of course it is not a hostile use, but uh, anyway I think uh, it's high time for us to um, you know think about uh, the use of you know try uh, the 
uh, uh, to, to uh, think about the impact of those kind of technology on, on uh, you know. So, you know, there is an old uh, treaty uh, which uh, prohibits use of uh, you know, environment modification technology uh, uh, for hostile and uh, military use. So uh, we have to think about what kind of technology it are exactly prohibited by the uh, treaty. And also we have to think about how to implement that uh, technology. This is not a, you know, uh, you know, future agenda. I think it is already a present agenda. So I would like to have a comment on these issues. Well, thank you very much for um, this very important um, question of arms control and the use of technology it could be used for multiple um, purposes um, and um, including, you know, geoengineering. It has both its benefits and um, problems also. So um, um, who would feel um, comfortable to address this um, question and maybe to the to the participants also? <laughs> I'm afraid I can't say too much about that. I've heard that the Chinese and other countries, of course, are working on such programs, but they're all classified. They're not going to reveal much information about how they can change the weather or how they could use it to uh, hinder an enemy's advance. Um, unfortunately, they don't publish that information. But sure, that's definitely a, an aspect that should be further studied and considered, of course what impact that could have long-term on environment could be huge depending on what sort of gases or materials they release into the atmosphere, of course. But I, I don't have any details on that, I'm afraid. Uh, Fabrizio-san or Akimoto-san, would you like to add? Thank you very much. Um, a very important uh, comment. And uh, I think the... Uh, uh, some arrangement or system are needed to uh, uh, dealing with climate security in the region, uh, not only the, in the region, but uh, all the uh, global level. And uh, I think we, uh, when we see, uh, when we uh, think about the uh, system or arrangement, the, uh, the uh, free and open idea and uh, rule-based idea is very much important and uh, uh, broad idea is very much welcome so the uh, we should uh, organize some uh, 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 multilateral uh, dialogue inviting uh, the uh, uh, so-called uh, like-minded nations <laughs> not to the uh, authoritarian uh, network and uh, then uh, uh, discuss uh, make a dialogue uh, how to deal with climate security including the uh, technology base and uh, or, or even uh, AI uh, artificial intelligence so forth so uh, I'd like to uh, think about more from now on thank you very much for your comment um, I think anything regarding weapons, which also would be, in that case, also a weapon, uh, it's just the same like with uh, AI or cybersecurity. Um, it would be great if those new and modern technologies could somehow be regulated internationally and uh, different parties could just reveal and put what they have on the cards and say, this is not somewhere we want to go. But it's very difficult to reach that among warring or disputing parties. There's a lot of mistrust right now among the big superpowers. So um, unfortunately, I don't see any of the two sides agreeing on that anytime soon. Um, you can see how difficult it has become just to reach an uh, agreement on what are the limits of AI in terms of military use. Um, and I think that uh, will probably also extend to a uh, 20 uh, uh, at least temporary changes to uh, to the weather. Yeah, thank you very much for raising if this I... very important topic. Um, I think it's important to, oh, sorry, Fabsan, please. Add very briefly, I suspect that some friends in the Pacific 
will tell us that they are already the victims of JU engineering on a global scale. Uh, but uh, you know, on the more um, well topical uh, note, uh, there are areas in the in in the region that are experiencing more uh, recurrent and longer dry spells. For example, like Ocean Island in Kiribati, and uh, they will certainly benefit from the regulated and uh, um, beneficial use of those uh, geoengineering technology or, or, or weather uh, engineering technologies. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think it's important to consider um, rule-based um, implementation of uses of different kinds of technologies, but the advances are so fast. Um, yeah, it's it's going to be a huge, huge challenge. Um, yeah, we are fortunate to have um, three minutes left. Um, if you have any additional comments, questions, please. Yeah, maybe just a quick question, uh, a topic that hasn't been coming up so much yet, but maybe to Fabrizio, um, he was talking about large ocean states and like the exclusive economic zones um, um, that many Pacific Island states um, have. Um, and I was wondering if you could um, comment a bit on the on the topic of deep sea mining as a potentially contentious issues issue um, for um, small island states. Um, of course, under increasing pressure, under increasing economic pressure, climate pressure, and as I understand, some um, island states see deep sea mining maybe as a potential um, avenue to, to generate new funding streams, especially as tuna um, fisheries might move out of their economic zones. Um, and I was wondering if you could could give us a bit of his perspective on that on that issue. Uh, yes, please. A very hot topic for the region. Fab Sam, please. Yes, it's a very top to topic. Is one of the uh, um, divisive issues in the region right now, uh, because there are uh, Pacific Island states that, as you as you uh, uh, seem to look at uh, deep sea mining as uh, a source of. Uh, important source of revenue or even a, a source of economic salvation, uh, both as a, a sponsor of mining operation in their exclusive economic zones, like in the case of the Cook Islands that have very rich cobalt deposits in their exclusive economic zones, or Nauru, which is uh, a, on the uh, front line of uh, pushing for commercial deep sea mining, especially as a sponsor state, while other Pacific Island countries like Fiji and others call for a moratorium. Uh, I think that the, the the issue will continue to be divisive in in the region, but we should also keep in mind that there are states very far from the Pacific Islands, like Norway, for example, that have uh, issued laws and basically gave green light to uh commercial deep sea mining so in, from my point of view on the one hand yes one question is whether the region will be uh, the harbinger the initiator of deep sea mining globally especially in the pacific in the, the in the, in the uh, international uh, uh, waters the pacific in the clarion clipperton area or if uh the region will just end up being invested by an ongoing trend of deep sea mining that will be uh, start in other, geopo in other geographical quadrant and eventually come to the region. Uh, I mean, uh, mining interests know very well that Pacific Island states, 
of some Pacific Island states look at that option with great hope and expectations. And so they, I personally think that the issue should be discussed much further uh, without any rush to a period of consequences. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I must say that um, our given time is up. Um, I think it's hard to draw a conclusion, but I think we managed to um, present important perspectives um, when thinking climate security in the space of ocean. And yeah, we would like to definitely consider additional points also in our joint re research. So thank you so much. And um, please give a big uh, round of applause to our um, distinguished speakers. And thank you for your participation. Thank you very much for your active participation. Now we have a break, our last break, and we will resume at 5.50 Japan time. Now we resume the symposium. Maybe. Welcome to the integrative session, bridging climate security debates with policy implications. It is my pleasure to invite Dr. Osamu Mizuno, Program Director, Adaptation and Water Area of IGES, who will moderate the session. Dr. Mizuno, please take the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I've, I'm afraid that you all are sort of exhausted, but please be patient a bit and uh, keep, give me uh, your focus just the uh, last uh, 50 or 60 minutes. And I was instructed that uh, we can conclude a bit earlier. So I'm ho aiming at uh, finishing a bit uh, earlier. So uh, please be patient. And uh, at this session is a uh, last session. So therefore, it is uh, intended to summarize today's discussion, and especially uh, touched upon the issue that uh, is not a, uh, um, the suggest ideas or suggestions or the policy implications, what we can, uh, what kind of uh, messages we can uh, draw from today's discussion to the policy makers. Um, but uh, today uh, I have uh, four distinguished uh, panelists uh, Dr. Utam Sinha, uh, Senior Fellow, Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, India. Uh, Dr. Takashi Sek Sekiyama, Associate Professor, Kyoto University. And uh, Dr. Prabhakar Sivapurian, uh, Principal Policy Researcher, IGES. And Tobias Ide, Senior Lecturer in Politics and International Relations, Mudaf. Uh, University of Australia, Australia. And uh, 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 we originally uh, planned to have uh, Dr. Ellen Skolsky, but unfortunately uh, from, from the uh, uh, Center for Climate Security, the US, but unfortunately she cannot make it. So today's panel uh, consists of four experts. And uh, as I said, this is a concluding session. So uh, the guiding questions are so designed. So please, would you, would you show the screen the, about the guiding question? Oh, no. Oh, really? Okay. So <laughs> the guiding question, maybe I can read it out. Uh, we have three guiding questions. Uh, I will just uh, inform that uh, I shouldn't change these questions because they already prepared the answer straight. The first question is, what are the two key takeaways from today's symposium. Second question is, how do climate change induced security uh, dynamics influence policy making in Japan and in the broader Asian region? And the last question is, what are the challenges and opportunities in integrating 
the crime and security debates into policy making. Uh, but uh, still, I believe that, that this is um, uh, the 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 first opportunity as a, for the panelists to speak to this uh, symposium. So I I'm wonder I I believe it's a bit pity just to ask them to summarize the discussion, but. Uh, we want to hear their own views, exactly what their insight or their thoughts on the climate security issue. So therefore, I just want to first uh, um, pass the mic to the other speakers to speak up the, uh, to share your own thoughts or insights, especially ideally, which has not been well uh, stressed during the today's discussion and the, your new ideas to um, to share with uh, with the participants. So. I first uh, want to invite uh, Dr. Utam Chinha. You, can you share your thoughts on crime and security? Well, um, um, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and greetings to IGES. I think uh, uh, the proceedings has been uh, very much uh, enriching. We've had uh, several uh, thoughts and ideas um, uh, that sort of bring the whole issue of uh, climate and security into a certain context. But um, before I uh, answer uh, some of the key takeaways of uh, today's symposium, I must say that I have been um, quite uh, intrigued by the use of uh, Asia Pacific as a, a geopolitical construct for the theme of the seminar. You know, I'm reminded that uh, of Prime Minister Kishida's visit to India last year, and he delivered a speech, the future of Indo-Pacific. And we know very much how much uh, Japan has been articulating the idea of Indo-Pacific. So I was in some sense quite intrigued uh, to find Asia Pacific in the theme, but I was equally impressed how the differentiation between the two, the Indo-Pacific and Asia Pacific was laid out in the keynote speech earlier uh, in the morning. So, uh, you know, without getting into this debate uh, about Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific, um, I would like to just say that, you know, India-Pacific is here, but Asia-Pacific lives on, as one article suggested. Uh, anyway, nonetheless, I think some, some elements that have come out which are um, quite striking and important to take note is First and foremost, I think climate risks are uh, transnational, and that has been clearly laid out. It's multidimensional, and it impacts both traditional and uh, non-traditional security. And this has probably been the underlining theme of this, this conference. My two key takeaways, and I think I'd like to delve a bit on these two points, which I'll just say, are the two Ds. I define it as the two Ds, uh, diplomacy and development. And I think these two are increasingly interdependent in this very fast changing world in which climate is playing a very important role. On the first, on diplomacy, uh, as you know, climate change interfaces with uh, states development, uh, places challenges on food, water and energy supplies and alters geopolitical dynamics, uh, nations and uh, intergovernmental institutions will need to develop a more sophisticated means of addressing these issues. Now, this may include incorporating climate concerns into the multilateral institutions, such as the UN Security Council. I know there's been several debate in the council itself, starting from 2007 onwards, on trying to link climate and security. But I think this debate needs to be further refined. Uh, the G7 again is an important platform where these issues can be uh, debated and discussed. And more importantly now, the G20, where India was uh, the president of it last year. I think the idea is to create uh, new international institutions to address these uh, very interlinked uh, climate-related challenges and try to understand how uh, climate security can become a very important element of bilateral relationship uh, between states. However, um, given that climate change represents enormous risks to global security, uh, responding to this also provides uh, 
great opportunity for increasing cooperation. And I think climate diplomacy will be a key element to this. But climate diplomacy has to be guided by the best available science and information sharing to enhance our overall adaptive capacity, strengthen resilience, and reduce vulnerabilities. On the second takeaway, uh, which I have derived, is the development. I think we are seeing several fragile nations, you know, that are already experiencing conflict, extreme poverty, weak institutions of governance, are, I think, most vulnerable uh, to the effects of a changing climate. Uh, these nations are also the most likely uh, to experience an increased incidence of conflict as a result of several stresses uh, that climate change will introduce. And therefore, they would become high security risk countries or high security risk regions. Now, in this context, again, agencies and international institutions concerned with a developmental focus will need to ensure that assistance to these nations are not only climate sensitive, but also that climate policies and investments are conflict sensitive. So climate sensitive and conflict sensitive. That's how we have to look towards development. Now, both these two, diplomacy and development, will greatly bring in regional and global stability and hopefully um, a pathway to resilience that can help recover from or to mitigate vulnerability to climate-related shocks that a whole lot of issues are going to bring extreme weather events and resource degradation. Now, to bring stability and enhance resilience, a collaborative approach would be required at both the regional and global levels by improving governance of climate issues. Shared responses of the climate crisis, I think, are both a political imperative and an economic opportunity for all actors present in the Asia-Pacific or the Indo-Pacific, as you may like to call it. Now, how nations choose to adapt will need to be at the forefront of government and international thinking, especially if critical infrastructure, agriculture, fisheries, energy and water security is to be protected, human tragedy avoided, and instability prevented. So these are my initial thoughts and my certain takeaways from the proceedings today. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Shihab. Um, and then uh, uh, let me invite uh, Dr. Sekiyama, please. Thank you, Mizuno-san. Uh, I'm Takashi Sekiyama from Kyoto University in Japan. Well, the, before answering Mizuno-san's question on the two key uh, takeaways, I'd like to briefly share my own perspective on climate security. Um, I think that climate security can be defined as protecting countries and societies from the conflicts and riots induced by climate change. And uh, under this definition, I have a two, I have a two dimension perspective on climate security. Um, I assume there are two main types of climate security risks. Okay? The one includes ethnic conflicts, anti-government riots, and the civil wars that are uh, caused by natural phenomena due to climate change. The other one includes conflicts between nations that are uh, caused by uh, mitigation policies or adaptation policies uh, to climate change. And I think uh, speakers in the thematic this the thematic Discussion two talked about the first type of climate security today, uh, that is conflict directly or indirectly caused by socioeconomic turbulences, such as climate migrants, resource depletion, and the food crisis due to climate change. Um, on the other hand, as mentioned by many other scholars, including Professor uh, Michael Mering and uh, uh, speakers in the thematic discussion one, uh, we should not forget another type of climate security risks, that is uh, a conflict caused by uh, mitigation policies and uh, adaptation policies. And in this context, I am focusing on energy transition, green industrial policies, and uh, geoengineering mentioned by uh, Dr. Tokuchi, 
as climate related policy that could spark new conflicts among the countries in near future. So uh, that is my uh, perspective on climate security. And in answering Mizuno-san's question on the two key takeaways, first of all, it is very impressive to me that over 500 audience from all over the world registered for this event today. I think this shows very high international interest in climate security in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, climate security research has geographically concentrated in Africa, uh, you know, until recently. Although the Asia-Pacific region also faces a variety of climate security risks, as we discussed today, uh, it has not yet been well investigated, unfortunately. So that is partly because, I think, there are so very few climate security researchers in this region, in the Asia-Pacific region, comparing it to in Europe and the United States. So I hope this event will be a good opportunity to stimulate international interest in climate security in the Asia-Pacific region and more research on this region. So that is my first impression about this event. Secondary, uh, as we learned through today's symposium, we, uh, we should be noted that climate security must be viewed from multiple perspectives. As I said earlier, uh, we discussed the climate security risks mainly from two different perspectives, right? So um, as we discussed today, we should be noted that climate security must be viewed from multiple perspectives. That is my second uh, key takeaway. Thank you very much. Yep, that's today's discussion. So next, I would like to invite Prabhakar-san. Prabhakar, you, you have pro. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mizuno san, for this opportunity. And hello to uh, everyone. Um, so, basically, uh, my takeaways from today's uh, event, which has been very uh, vibrant and also very interesting discussions throughout the day, I'm very much, um, I learned a lot myself. Um, especially what I liked uh, in today's event has been that we try to uh, disambiguate the climate security by dissecting into different elements. Uh, we talked about food security, we talked about energy security, and we discussed about um, you know the interlinkages uh, with other issues like uh, migration and things like that, uh, which is a very good beginning, I would say, because um, uh, the communication, uh, the, that's the first of my uh, first takeaway, is the communication of the issues and the solutions and concepts is very important when we talk to uh, stakeholders from different backgrounds. You know, we talked about energy security today, and when an energy expert attended this uh, event today, then he should be knowing that okay, what the government is already doing, and what more the government needs to do in order to address the climate security issues within the energy. Uh, he should not be confused that, okay, uh, we already know the energy access, energy price, you know, these issues and countries are dependent on imported energy and what additional things have to do uh, in, uh, in addition to addressing these issues, you know, uh, what is that angle of the, the security that I have to bring in my own policy space? The same applies to the food security as well. You know, if you look at the food security, the countries have been working on various angles of the food security. Uh, then by placing the food security within the, the perspective of the climate security, what is that additionally the, the food-related ministries have to do? So that, that's a kind of angle that we try to bring in uh, that will help the stakeholders to uh, clearly say what they, uh, see what they have already been doing and what is that additionality that they need to bring in to address the concerns of the security uh, experts or security community. The second thing I, I see clearly very um, in today's discussions is uh, the convergence of the global uh, issues at the local level, as well as uh, the local issues becoming globalized uh, because of the globalization partly, and also because the partly the climate change uh, that is uh, basically you know uh, complicating uh, various aspects. 
so this uh, convergence of the issues is uh, is a kind of uh, complicating the policy space uh, because the countries uh, historically have been addressing uh, various issues based on the information that they have which is very much local you know which is very much uh, uh, within the boundaries of the countries and they seldom or most of the time have not cared for um, the factors outside the boundaries for other than the uh, military security for example so this change in the paradigm of you know how the global issues are increasingly affecting the local uh, concerns uh, is uh, is a new challenge that the governments are will continue to face and uh, i think uh, the governments uh, would have to be definitely uh, you know increase their capacity and strengthen their policy process in order to address these uh, uh, issues which have been uh, far beyond their uh, purview right now uh, or until today uh, of course the things have been changing and we will discuss that in the next portion thank you yeah thank you very much uh, so um, last speaker is ida san you have the floor good evening and thanks a lot for inviting me to this interesting and very important symposium um i'm actually not just senior lecturer in in perth in australia but i'm also currently specially appointed full professor at uh, hiroshima university so i'm currently living in japan um i think i um talk about my perspectives on the topic when i answer to your question so i start with the key takeaways and i actually have three key takeaways but they are very short um because i know you're all probably hungry so um, i'm 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 going to do so the first key takeaway point from the symposium is that climate security is a key challenge in the asia pacific region including in and for japan and it hence requires um serious action both in the research and in the policy space and that's why i very much welcome i just having this expert project the second key takeaway is that climate security is not just an issue in and for for poor countries we talk a lot about food insecurity in thailand about migration in indonesia about potential conflicts in the philippines but we also learned today um about a lot of vulnerable both military but also other critical infrastructure in Japan being located very close to the coast um and when i talk in australia to militaries to decision makers we also they are also very concerned that a lot of military training facilities ammunition storage equipment malfunctioning due to increasing heat wave in australia's north so also the rich industrialized northern countries will be affected by climate change and affected security concerns and the third one and that connects to this, the discussions we had about global local interactions and their importance today is that uh, climate risks and climate insecurities in the asia pacific can have tremendous global impacts and global consequences and i think this becomes most obvious when we talk about supply chains two years ago when there was a serious heat wave in southern china um some of the production facilities there had to shut down in order to prevent the electricity grid from collapsing which would have left millions of people without power in the middle of the heat wave but that means some of the production the industrial production facilities had to shut down and as we all know that's a risk for global supply chains we also know that some of the high food prices we saw in the world around 2010 was triggered by major droughts in in china and some other asian countries so climate insecurity is not just an issue even if it happens within the region but through global supply chains and other factors can have major major follow up effects in other parts of the world and vice versa thank you very much uh thank, thank you for all the uh, panelists i think that uh, everybody give us a very nice summary of today's discussion uh, as a, a key takeaways but before moving on to the next questions i think uh, because this is a summary of today's discussion if there is anything missing as a key takeaway or a key message from today uh today's discussion uh, if there's any uh view you want to add from the floor uh please uh, share your thoughts with us or do you think it's perfect summary of the today's discussion it's okay okay thank <laughs> very good then 
Uh, let's move on to the, uh, I guess, second question and third question are very much interrelated. So I just want to ask uh, to ask the other uh, panelists to respond to the both uh, questions uh, together, combined. So maybe this time uh, the reverse order. Maybe once again I can can I ask the uh, Idesan to <laughs> answer to these questions? Um, yes, yes. Uh, very happy, and they're very good questions. So I I respond to both of them actually. So uh, how do, how does climate security affect policy making? How should it affect policy making? And I think the big advantage of the concept of climate security is that it raises one fundamental point because climate change will have massive impact on our ecosystems, the earth system, the water supplies, and by consequence on our economies and livelihoods and agriculture. And it would be naive to think that a global change of that magnitude would have no security implications. It has. And we heard a lot about today how it affects food disasters, conflicts, migration, health, and so on. And we need to prepare for that. And I think climate security is very helpful as a raise attention to the impacts climate change will have on the various effects on security to integrate research and then to bring that together to, to design policies. Um, something I would like to raise that is some, and that, that's my second of two points um, when it comes to policymaking is that as much as climate change is a problem, um, and an issue to be addressed and to be mitigated, and we can't mitigate it completely anymore. It might also raise some opportunities and some windows of possibilities that we can utilize in the future, even so climate change in and by itself is a bad thing. Don't get me wrong about that. Um, and if I can briefly show, can I share the screen? Yes, I can. Can you see that? Yes, you can see that. Um, so I just published a book last year with MIT Press on disasters and conflict risks. And I'm not going to talk much about the book, but one of the findings of the book is that in roughly, so I investigate 36 cases of disasters striking armed conflict zones, and I assess how they shape conflict risks. And in one quarter of the cases, in the first year after the disaster can be drought, can be storm, we see conflicts actually de-escalating. We see parties fighting less. Sometimes because the disaster is very difficult to deal with for the rebel groups, for the government, sometimes there's a lot of international attention. So the parties try to you know, act nice and not fight too much. Um, so something we know is that in periods where there's less fighting between conflict parties, there are, there's a higher chance of diplomacy, of mediation, of bringing in aid because it's more secure, there's less fighting. So if we have these climate-related disasters in the first year, that's an opportunity to bring the parties to the table, to kickstart negotiations, to bring in aid. And that's something that diplomats, that aid agencies can actually use. Um, to their advantage, even so the disasters, of course, are a pretty bad thing, usually causing many deaths. Um, so that's something we should we should shift our attention to. All right. And then going on to the third question, what challenges or opportunities are there for integrating climate security into policy? So the first one is facilitate more research. We already know a lot about climate security, but there are also large knowledge gaps, quite a few which have been mentioned. So having projects such as this one are key in generating policy relevant knowledge on climate security. So first of all, invest in creating more knowledge. The second one is um, utilize the knowledge that is already there, talking about climate security in the Indo-Pacific or the Asia-Pacific and following um, the definition of my fellow panelists, the book contains 21 case studies of climate-related disasters affecting conflict risks in the Asia-Pacific. There's excellent work by other scholars on conflict and migration in India, in the Philippines, in Indonesia. So there's, I agree that compared to Africa, Middle East, there is not a lot, but there are several excellent studies. And we can draw on that. And drawing on that would help us to avoid some of um, avoid um, basically some shortcomings because it is important that once we have the knowledge, policy also listens to the research. And that's, that's I think, an obligation for both policy to listen to research, but also to research to communicate 
the insights. Um, and to give you just one example, I quite often have when talking to decision makers in Australia, there's always this idea that oh, climate change leads to disasters. Then all the people from Bangladesh, from India, they will come to Australia. And I said, no, that's not going to happen. That's not, I mean, you don't. And then they said, we need better border enforcement. And I said, no, this is not going to happen because what happens if there's a big drought in India? Well, the people sell their cattle. Um, they go into the cities to work there. They adapt. They try to stay on the farm. Then there's the second year where they probably have a big flood. Um, and then they sell some of their assets, you know, send, stop sending their children to school. Then there's the third year with another disaster, another drought or flood. Then if they cannot do any better, then they might resort to migration. But by then their assets, their incomes, their saving will be depleted. And a flight to Australia is expensive, even if you have all the legal guarantees, if you need some illegal like fake passports or smuggling to go to Europe, it's even more expensive, right? So they don't have the assets anymore. They stay there. They are unable to migrate, perhaps then go to the next urban slum. Um, so if you care about these impacts of climate change on mobility, don't invest in border protection in Australia, invest in adaptation and coping in urban planning in the areas, that's how good policy looks like. And that needs to be inspired by research and not by, oh, there's a disaster in India, the people will all come over here, not at all. Um, but I think that's that's really important, how we could move forward. Um, and again, I think the symposium and the project are really a step to achieve that. Uh, very insightful. Uh, so uh, next, uh, Prabhakarza, you have the floor. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mizuno san. So some of the policy shifts that we see as a response to uh, either climate change or non-climate change drivers, but still they have relevance for climate change and related security concerns, uh, which has already been one of them uh, has already been uh, uh, discussed by previous uh, panelists. That is the supply chains. You know, historically we see that supply chains are rigid. You know, they are fixed. We don't see supply chain shifting uh, within a very short span of time, but but we see that as maybe as a result of the COVID or even with emerging war and security situations, countries are increasingly hunting for alternative uh, supply chains uh, for resources on which they are dependent, and this is a very um, to a certain extent is very heartening uh, to me uh, by looking at the way the countries are really concerned. Uh, and it's very uh, interesting also to look at you know, the bureaucrats and the governments actively talking about supply chains in their policy discussions. Uh, and that's a very uh, welcome change and which will have the security implications uh, greatly for the global stability as well. Uh, a part of these uh, shifts are, is also leading to more self-reliance. Uh, more local production, you know, promotion of the the, the local uh, products and the local uh, innovations. Uh, we see in many areas like you know precious metals. Countries are increasingly now talking about uh, semiconductors, and you know they don't have to dependent on uh, other countries for these, including even energy, energy self dependency, and all these shifts. They will definitely have. Um, uh, these are the policy shifts, welcoming shifts, and will have very good positive uh, impact on the security aspects of the countries and societies to in years to come. The third aspect that we see is more uh, engagement. Of course, we, we see there is a there is a realignment of the the players on the global stage. However, uh, we see that there is a more willingness for the countries to engage with other countries. Uh, however, those shifts may have changed. Uh, the traditional players are no more there. Uh, new players have come on board, uh, and and which is making this entire uh, geopolitical uh, you know landscape very dynamic and very interesting. Now, I have not seen. I mean, in the last. 15, 20 years of the work experience, that geopolitics have come into in every angle of the environmental sciences. Uh, we, we have not seen this kind of evolution uh, previously, and which, which makes uh, global policy making a very interesting area uh, than before. And maybe that's one of the reasons why UNFCCC and other uh, you know, global uh, uh, you know, policy uh, frameworks, they are increasingly becoming very successful, increasingly becoming accessible to communities. You know, uh, local people, they're talking about these global frameworks. Uh, you would not believe that, you know, the COP28 becomes so, so famous among the people because the two global leaders, they took a 
a selfie, you know, and then it becomes such a viral that even people who doesn't know about these global frameworks, they, they come to know and they discuss about these things, even outside the expertise areas, you know, even by the common people. So that's what I see in terms of the policy shifts, the more accessibility of these uh, issues and, and the willingness of the uh, various uh, non-traditional stakeholders to engage with them. And, and that's very good. Uh, in terms of the challenges and opportunities, what I see that the first opportunity and the most important one is that we have made very significant progress on many of these global frameworks, whether you call it um, Kyoto Protocol or Paris Agreement or UNFCCC or um, Biodiversity Convention or SFDRR, a lot of these conventions and frameworks, though they evolved independently and largely not in coordination or cooperation with each other, uh, but they, they are uh, being rapidly implemented, rapidly accepted by the governments. And there is a willingness by the governments to you know, very um, actively portray the progress that they are making in many of the areas, whether it is renewable energy or water resources, food security, or even SDGs. You go to India or even Japan, you see SDG pictures uh, posted everywhere. You know, when have we seen this kind of uh, 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 application or even ownership of these global frameworks at the local level, uh, which is very good. So I see that this is, this is a very good opportunity for the climate security. Uh, of course, these frameworks were not evolved uh, by keeping in view the climate security, but now the climate security experts will start looking into these frameworks and see, okay, what is the synergy that they bring to the climate security and what additionality has to be done to make them much, much more you know, leak-proof or fail-proof. So that, that's a good uh, opportunity I see. And in terms of the challenge, I see that there's still probably, it's a risk as well, that the countries may not be willing to cooperate on certain issues. Um, I know each one of us can have those issues on top of our mind, and probably they will continue to limit our ability to cooperate beyond a certain limit. And how do we actually break that uh, a ceiling is, is the only uh, the matter of uh, greater engagement and greater discussion. Um, that's what I see going forward. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Prabhupada. Huh? Then next, uh, I want to invite uh, Sakyama san. Thank you, Mizuno san. Um, in discussing the impact of climate security uh, dynamics on policy making, especially in Japan, I think we'd better discuss foreign policy and domestic policy separately. On the one hand, climate security has influenced the Japanese foreign policy these years. Uh, because the Japanese constitution prohibits the use of force to settle international disputes, it is difficult for Japan to engage in international cooperation on the traditional security issue. Uh, however, climate security, this non-traditional security issue is easier for Japan to address. And for example, Japan can support Asian developing countries through ODA to reduce social and economic vulnerabilities that link uh, climate change and conflict. And uh, Japan can play a greater role in discussions and cooperation on climate security at the international level, such as G7, G20, and the UN Security Council. In fact, Japan has included climate-related risks in, the, in its national security strategy in 2022. And also Japan's ODA policy guideline revised in 2023 also states strengthening socioeconomic autonomy, autonomy and resilience, enhancing food security and energy security, as well as improving climate change mitigation and adaptation as Japan's ODA policy priorities. On the other hand, climate security is less likely to influence Japan's domestic policies, including climate change mitigation, I think. I think uh, this is because Japan is less directly threatened by climate change induced migrants and uh, uh, conflicts. I think uh, that'll be one of the reasons why Japan is not very active in climate change mitigation also. 
And uh, regarding the challenges and opportunities in integrating the climate security debates into policy making, again, I would like to discuss foreign policy and uh, domestic policy separately. As for foreign policy, uh, Japan's enthusiasm to be a permanent member of the UN Security Council would be the biggest opportunity in integrating the climate security debate into Japan's foreign policy. And uh, as I said earlier, it is easier for Japan to address climate security than traditional security issues in the international arena, such as uh, the UN Security Council. So this issue can be a good stepping stone for Japan to become an active member of the UN Security Council. So um, the challenge is maybe China, okay? It is not only because China has always opposed to opposed to Japan's permanent membership of the UN Security Council, but also because China has opposed to discuss climate security issue at the UN Security Council. Uh, so, you know, um, although this issue, I mean, climate security would be a good chance for Japan to be a permanent member of uh, the UN Security Council. But, uh, you know, China and Russia would be uh, <laughs> uh, obstacles. Secondary, regarding the domestic policy, uh, the challenge could be the lack of a sense of danger in this country. You know? As I said, Japan is less directly threatened by climate change induced migrants and conflicts. That's why uh, the Japanese business, politicians, and the citizens have hardly felt a sense of danger from climate change. That is a big difference from the situation in Europe, for example, I think. Having said that, um, public opinion in Japan may change as the number of climate change-related disasters increase in this country. As the impact of climate change becomes more and more apparent, the sense of danger from climate change would also increase. So this could drive the integration of climate security debates into not only foreign, not only foreign policy making, but also uh, domestic policy makings, even in Japan. So that's my perspective. Thank you. Thank you for insights, especially uh, implications to the Japanese policy. And uh, finally, I want to invite uh, Shin Hasan. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, uh, how do climate change induced security dynamics influence policy making? Increasingly so. Uh, and let me explain. Um, Asia will be much exposed to the impacts of climate change, undoubtedly. Um, India and China together uh, make for 2.7 billion people. Uh, and that was the population of the world in 1955. Asia, both from its uh, uh, huge landmass and ocean, uh, has the geographic and human attributes to potentially become the epicenter of global climate crisis. Climate risks or um, uh, stresses that will emerge will manifest in you know, multiple forms, uh, posing challenges to policy making. And the combination of these uh, stresses will create uh, levels of instability in certain locations and an existential threat to basic human survival in others. For example, erratic and severe disruptions to weather patterns will affect food productivity, um, especially in areas that are already susceptible to flooding and temperature increases. A stable supply of water will be critical to peace and stability and prosperity in South Asia region and the Southeast Asian region. Glaciers in the Himalaya and the Tibetan Plateau are the vital source of several major Asian rivers that cut across uh, political boundaries. Acute changes to the oceanic system uh, across the Indo-Pacific region is expected over the coming decades as a result of increasing thermal temperature range and acidification. Oceanic circulation, fish stocks, and biodiversities are critical in Asia that relies heavily upon the marine proteins as its major source of food. So any future alteration to the Earth's system 
will affect the entire Asia, potentially driving uh, political and security decision making. Now, keeping all these potential impacts, policy making will therefore have to be interdisciplinary and interministerial. It has also to follow a certain democratized and decentralized pathways. And finally, I think to have a long term perspective, uh, policy making needs to be preventive and precautionary in its outlook. So the two I's, which essentially means interdisciplinary and interministerial, the two D's, democratized and decentralized, and the two P's, preventive and precautionary. Now, there are going to be certain influences to policy making, and I see some that emerge are as follows. Um, weak governance and fragmentation of the international system can greatly reduce the ability of nations to respond to climate crisis and thereby uh, potentially reduce the willingness and ability of external actors uh, to assist. New alliances uh, and partnerships may form as low-income countries will find themselves increasingly less able to adapt or mitigate the impacts of climate change. Failures of nations to adjust to climate-related variations in Asia could be exacerbated further as many countries are dependent upon natural resources for sustainment and the primary form of national income, which will increase economic risk and stall future development. In Asia, uh, and these are the 2020 figures, the cost attributed to natural disasters was 67 billion US dollar out of the 210 billion uh, that is sort of impacted globally. Now, given the likelihood of future natural disasters in the region, an efficient, timely, and successful support during a humanitarian crisis will be an important lever of influence and status uh, for certain countries in Asia. Now, as the consequences of these uh, influences that I have mentioned, uh, climate change will continue, I think, to reshape every aspect of the region's economy, from politics to migration, financing and supply chains, and thus uh, greatly influence policy making. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now uh, we have gone through the, all the questions assigned to us, so it's, uh, uh, it must be okay to conclude our discussion. So uh, just uh, give a big hand to uh, join me to give hand to the other panelists first. Thank you very much. And uh, interesting enough that today's uh, today's uh, uh, symposium has a unique uh, arrangement, so there is no closing remark session. So, so I, I, on behalf of the uh, organizer, just want to say thank you all the participants, especially the uh, experts coming all the way from abroad. And uh, I, I, I think that we had a very good discussion, a constructive information sharing uh, networking. It's a very excellent networking opportunity. And uh, as as we already introduced, that uh, this uh, research project will continue in the coming two years. So I'm hoping that we are hoping that uh, we can further strengthen our collaboration and uh, deliver very meaningful results, which could have an important implication to the policy making in Japan and beyond. And I also want to say once again, thank you to the, all the participants uh, joining through the Zoom. As, as Sakemasan uh, pointed out, that uh, it was so encouraging for us to have uh, such a big audience and uh, who shows uh, interest, great interest to this topic and uh, this uh, meeting and uh, we are hoping that uh, we can have another op opportunity like this uh, in the coming hopefully uh, coming years so um, uh, with uh, new findings and uh, uh, new discussions so i'm hoping that uh, we can have another opportunity to interact with you once again and with that i just want to conclude this meeting so thank you very much bye, -bye. thank you thank you thank you Thank you all. Bye.